for something a little bit different as we take a look at Pokemon Black and White. In many ways, the fifth generation of Pokemon is often overshadowed by other entries in the series, and could even be referred to as the franchise's divisive black. Whether it's the revamped formula, emphasis on story, or the fact the game's released on the Nintendo DS with its successor imminent, black and white stick out like sore thumbs even years after they debut. But despite being a punching bag of sorts for a small but vocal portion of the Pokemon community, these titles do have a rabid following who celebrate all of the controversial features that made black and white so polarizing right out of the gate. Regardless of which side you lean towards, the fact remains that after years of following the same cookie cutter formula, Game Freak aspired to do more with the fifth generation of their signature franchise, and if their goal was to reinvent and redefine what Pokemon could be, then they succeeded. And it's not like these games were failures or anything, far from it, with sales just north of 15 million units sold worldwide, as well as impressive review scores across the board. Even the world-renowned and often stingy Famitsu gave these Junichi Masuda directed games a perfect score. So, when the games released in March 2010 here in North America, both excitement and expectations were feverishly high. When it comes to my own involvement with Gen 5, I didn't purchase either game until the summer of 2011 when I needed a solid title for my brand new 3DS. Unfortunately for me, the only decent launch game at the time was sold out everywhere, that being the Ocarina of Time remake, and rather than begrudgingly pick up Pilot Wings or something else of that caliber, I opted instead to buy Pokemon White since all my friends had left to begin their first year of college, and I finally felt I could get back into the series without being judged too harshly by my peers. Was that a stupid reason to stop playing something I loved for such a long time? Absolutely, but thank Arceus I gave in to my inner child and just went for it, because it was my experience with Pokemon White that re-sparked my passion for the entire series, and it's also highly likely their fault that I'm here on YouTube today bringing you an hour-long vanity project disguised as a review. But all jokes aside, I'm barely scratching the surface of the impact that these video games had on my life at the time, and more importantly, what makes them so special to people like me and millions of others across the globe. And I'm certain that, like other cult classics turned beloved gems such as Earthbound and Majora's Mask, these contentious games will eventually have their day in the sun, and it won't be too much longer now until cries for a Switch remake become as loud and obnoxious as a vanilla shake. But for now, we've only got the originals to go off. So, let's switch gears and jump into one of the most adored aspects of Generation 5, and if you've never played these games before, just know that it's going to take a lot. This time around, we're greeted by Professor Juniper, who specializes in Pokemon Origins and is of course the first female professor in the series, which has no bearing on her character, but is both a positive step forward for representation, as well as the first of many formula breaks implemented to surprise and delight series veterans. Players will start off in the peaceful Nuvema town as either Hilda or... Hilbert. Wait, is that seriously the character's name? I'm not trying to be a comedian or anything, I just think that's an interesting choice considering you know, this region is based on New York City and the Americas. So those two names are just not what I expected, I guess. And yes, you heard me correctly, because for the first time ever, our story doesn't take place in a Japanese-inspired region, which makes for some creative locales, architecture, and of course, is the in-game explanation for why there are zero Pokémon from any of the previous generations found across Unova. The downside to this new monsters only rule is of course that adoring fans who've grown attached to certain teams or creatures over the past decade of games will be out of luck and need to build a brand new team starting from scratch. However, on the flip side, this means that while traversing and exploring Unova, each player gets to catch and befriend over 150 brand new additions to the roster, many with creative typing or designs that will hopefully grow in you throughout your journey. But of course, one can't start their journey without first obtaining their starter. In Generation 5, your choices include Snivy, Tepig, and the adorable Oshawa. And right after making your decision, you'll immediately take on your two new rivals, Bianca and Shiro. I can't give enough credit to how well-paced and streamlined this beginning tutorial is, as you receive your Pokémon partner, experience battles, and learn about your rivals and their motivations before even leaving the game. It's fun-filled action right off the bat, and it's a big departure from the standard and sometimes slow Pokémon origins we've come to know. Once acquainted with your new starter buddy, you and your two friends will head over to Juniper's lab, receive your Pokédexes, and set out towards Accumula Town, where you'll run into a vocal group of demonstrators known as Team Plasma for the first time. 
Unlike many of your past foes, these guys have no issues with being seen, and their plans are anything but secret. The organization, led by the charismatic sage Getsis, wish for all Pokémon to be liberated, as they believe that using these creatures as tools for battling and entertainment is inhumane. And unsurprisingly, many of the people around Unova listen and even sympathize with their dreams of equality for Pokémon. Once Getsis finishes, Team Plasma disbands and scuttles off to the next town, leaving the crowd with something to ponder. And it's during this time of reflection that a strange young man named N challenges our hero to a battle. When defeated, he'll proclaim his desire to better the world for Pokémon everywhere, and not long after he leaves, you'll find yourself headed towards Stryton City in order to face off against a trio of gym leaders named Silent, Chill, and Press, who each specialize in one particular Pokémon type. Don't worry though, despite there being three of them, you'll only have to take on whoever has a type advantage over your chosen starter. Which is a gimmick I love, as it teaches new players early on not to over-rely on their first partner Pokémon. With the win, you'll take home the Trio Badge in a spectacular 3D moment, and bump into Professor Juniper's friend Venom, who has to with bringing her back some green mist from the afternoon green yard just outside of Strike. Sadly though, once you arrive, you along with Bianca will catch the valiant Team Plasma who champions the freedom of Pokémon, berating and even abusing a terrified Muna in order to obtain the mist for himself. To the best of my knowledge, this is the first demonstration of physical Pokémon abuse in a main series game, and along with leaving players feeling sick, it does a lot to inform you of Team Plasma's human nature and plants the seeds for a despicable villain to root against. Once you dispose of the two grunts, Muna's mother will use its powers to exact revenge by conjuring up a nightmarish version of Yetis that terrifies them until they flee. And with that, you can safely give Fennel her dream mist and make your way to the historic Nectarine City. Although, before you make it there, you'll be doing battle with both Sharon and a few Fusion Plasma grunts for good measure. These guys are pushovers compared to the combined forces of you and your rival. And speaking of rivals, the mysterious end bumps into you once again as you enter the next museum. Once defeated, he claims he'll use the power of the legendary Pokémon Reshiram or Zekrom to make his dreams a reality and walks away. Sheesh, there's never a dull moment in these games. Once he's gone, you're free to enter the museum and take on its gym leader, Lenora, who specializes in normal type Pokémon. Also, in case that last part seemed a bit confusing, one of the most ambitious additions found in these games is that along with being the Counter City's best trainer, every gym leader also now holds down some sort of secondary career, such as pilot, artist, or in this case, museum curator. Whether this was done in order to give each leader more personality, or as a reflection of America's capitalistic nature, isn't entirely clear, but it is a great touch and certainly makes the world of Unova feel more realistic and lived in. These top trainers may serve as a test of strength for up and coming trainers, but they also contribute to their communities in a more positive way beyond just waiting for the next battle to start. And personally, I think it's one of the most subtle improvements the series has seen so far. Moving on though, once Lenora is defeated, she'll relinquish the basic side. But, and as you exit the gym, you'll find Team Plasma stealing the museum's prized dragon skull. With the help of Lenora's friend and fellow gym leader Berg, you follow the nefarious organization of the Forks, where after many battles you'll eventually come face to face with Gorm, who, like Getsis, is a member of the group's seven sages. He explains that they're looking for the remains of a legendary dragon Pokemon to assist in their liberation mission. After both Berg and Lenora arrive as backup, he cautiously retreats along with his run. After this, you're able to continue on your journey via the gorgeous Sky Arrow Bridge towards Castalia City, where Berg awaits your gym challenge. Before you can settle this score, however, Team Plasma turns up yet again in the Gargantuan Metropolis, this time having stolen Bianca's Pokémon. With her help, as well as the assistance of both Berg and a strange new girl named Iris, you'll have to scour the massive landmass that is Castelia in order to find Team Plasma's industrial headquarters. Upon entering the hideout, you'll come face to face with Getsis for the first time, as he recites the history of Unova and expresses his desire to bring back the legendary dragon Pokémon and pair them with the prophesied hero, who together will create a new world where all Pokémon can live free of human constraints. Once he's finished rambling, he'll return Bianca's Muna, and with his escape, you're finally able to battle the bug-wielding bird in order to collect the insect badge. With this new piece of hardware in hand, you'll continue on towards the always lively Nimbasa City while taking on an increasingly aggravated Sharon once more along the way. After a few beatdowns, this prideful perfectionist has become obsessed with pushing his Pokémon in order to become stronger. But before we can sympathize, we discover Team Plasma harassing an elderly man in Nimbasa City. Once they're taken care of, he'll repay your kindness with a brand new bike, which you can use to explore the wonders of the town's up-tempo paradise. Some of these must-see attractions include the city's popular athletic stadiums, its renowned musical theater, and of course the local theme park where you'll bump into your old pal N, who reveals in the most dramatic way possible that he is the true king of Team Plasma. 
It's his desire to save Pokemon worldwide from the inequality they suffer at the hands of humans. And once he's defeated, we're treated to a really nice POV shot where he announces that he'll become the champion of Unova in order to obtain the power and social platform required to fulfill these lofty ambitions, and that if we want to stop him, our hero will be forced to do the same. With that, End storms off, urging us to become stronger in both battle and in our convictions. And for once, our desire to become the champion is rooted in more than just tradition, as the relationship between humans and Pokémon is dependent on our ability to overcome N and his selfish goals. But of course, before all of that, we still have to collect the remaining five badges, and coincidentally, Mimbasa just happens to be the home to the glamorous Elisa, as well as a gym featuring roller coasters. After the Electric-type Mastermind, Sonic Supermodel throws in the towel to provide our player with a shiny new Bolt badge, as well as Bianca and her father with a voice of reason during their confrontation in the heart of the city. Now, I really love this exchange, and I'll go more in-depth later on, but for now, let's just say that this is a compelling scene full of standout character moments for both Bianca and Elisa. And in the end, the two make up and Bianca continues on her adventure, albeit with a more thoughtful perspective. And while we're speaking about rivals, almost immediately after this tearjerker of a moment, we're introduced to Alvin, the current champion of Unova, and Sharon is clearly unamused by his carefree antics. See, our studious friend, as mentioned before, strives to be the strongest trainer, which of course to him means constant training and discipline. So when he watches the man who wields the title he one day hopes to make his own, essentially goofing off and having fun on the job, you can understand why he gets so upset. However, after asking Sharon what he'd do after becoming champion, the judgmental rival is left dumbfounded, and despite his constant arguing, it's apparent that his convictions and resolve may not be as absolute as he projects. It's not long after this epiphany that we cross a newly opened drawbridge into the business-oriented Driftvale City and meet up with Clay, the town's mining mogul and ground type junior. He's upset that some Team Plasma members have moseyed on over to his beloved city, and offers our hero and Sharon a deal. If they successfully run the deplorable organization out of Driftvale, he'll allow them to challenge him fair and swift. Unfortunately for them, of all of the places they could have hid, they've decided to take over the town's cold storage, which has left them as cornered as they are frozen. After dispatching the swarm of grunts, their leader Zinzolin of the Seven Sages is apprehended by Clay, who offers to make good on his part. However, before the battle can begin, Getz disappears outside of the gym and threatens the Minor King with serious action if he doesn't release both Zinzolin and his goons. To avoid disturbing the city any further, Clay reluctantly agrees to these hostile demands and proclaims that a good old-fashioned gym battle should help cheer everyone up. And after making your way through the many mineshafts found in his arena, you'll fulfill your agreement and take on the no-nonsense cowboy, eventually walking away with a quake badge in hand. Not long after the battle, Clay will assist you in de-webbing Cardstone Cave, and man, is this place a treat for the eyes. However, before you can fully explore this electric wonderland, you'll be introduced to the Shadow Ninja, a group of Team Plasma Ninjas who take you to end. The mysterious king warns you that he's informed Getsis and the others all about you and your friends, and reminds you of the challenge he gave before disappearing into the cave. And after examining the area and running into Professor Juniper and Bianca, who are studying some Pokémon origins, you'll meet up with Team Plasma and end once more just before the exit. After another emotional battle, Eng shoots out the Unova scientist for assisting in the incarceration of Pokémon. However, Juniper raises some good points about letting individual trainers and Pokémon decide how they work best together. She debates that each person has their own distinct values and experiences that make their beliefs and convictions different, and that often things aren't always simply black and white. Get it? This infuriates him, who states that despite there being a few decent humans, he will not stay idle and watch more and more Pokémon be abused and mistreated by countless others. And with that bold proclamation, both he and our hero leave Chargestone Cave behind as we arrive in Mistbrookin City. Before you can do much of anything here, you'll receive an upgrade for your Pokédex from the one and only Professor Juniper. No, not that one. In a weird plot twist, our new Gemma Town mentor is actually the daughter of a famous scientist named Cedric, and while he's tinkering with your decks, you'll also bump into Mistleton's gym leader, Skyla, who seems to be occupied with potentially sick Pokémon atop the Celestial Tower. Also, as a side note, do all these gym leaders choose their type specialty based on their names, or do they just take up clever monikers after they become well-known? They're always just so convenient, like a butler being named Jeeves, or being a successful talk show host named Jimmy, I guess. Anyways, after you follow her up what turns out to be yet another Pokémon graveyard, she'll successfully heal the ailing Pokémon and have you ring a large bell. And now that she's seen your abilities firsthand, it's time for an official challenge at her airport gym, and after going down harder than Amelia Earhart, she'll award you with the jetpack. What, too soon? Upon exiting the building, a seemingly 
conflicted end will approach you and reveal Team Plasma's plan of resurrecting Unova's legendary dragon Pokemon from ancient stone, and use their combined power to liberate all his Pokemon. It's in this conversation that he also reveals he's able to directly communicate with all Pokemon, and is shocked to learn our hero and their Pokemon get along and want to work together. As he leaves, he laments that if more humans and Pokemon got along like this, he wouldn't have to go through with Team Plasma's plan in the first place, and with that, you're free to continue along until you run into Sharon, as well as Alder once again. After a hard-fought battle with your rival, Alder compliments you both. However, Sharon still isn't done brooding about his losses, and reiterates that he wants to have power so that people will acknowledge his strength. After he storms off yet again, we're able to access the expansive Twist Mountain, where we quickly find Clay in his mining playground. He mentions something about the Unova Gym Leaders meeting about Team Plasma, and then takes off leaving you and Sharon to explore the cavern. When you make it to the end, you'll run into a few Team Plasma fans who giddily inform you that they've uncovered the power they seek at a nearby tower. And as they depart Twist Mountain, Sharon decides to stay behind and consider what Alden meant, and he asks him what he'd do with the power he seeks. This frees us up to meet with the Elder Juniper as we enter Icarus City, where he mentions he's on his way towards Dragon Spiral Tower, the birthplace of fresh but before we can climb our second tower in as many towns, in his first battle, Icarus's anime-loving gym leader, Bryson, who, after being defeated, awards players with the Freeze Bat. That's not his only purpose, though, as on our way out of his gym, during a moment of discovery for Sharon and Bianca, he's able to detect the Shadow Triad who invite our hero to take on N at Dragon Spiral Tower. When you finally reach the top, you'll discover that N has successfully resurrected one of the legendary dragons of Unova from an ancient artifact, and as he flies off towards the infamous Pokemon League, he challenges you to do the same by locating the opposite stone. Now, with Alder's help, you'll need to confront Getsis at the Relic Castle back in the desert, who reveals that the stone you seek is missing, and that if Alder is unable to stop N from becoming a new champion, Team Plasma's vision will indeed be unstoppable. With that, our traditionally easy-going champion decides to get serious, and after we retrieve the special rock from Nora in Neptune City, he heads towards the Pokemon League for a final showdown with N, but asks that our hero continues growing and bonding with their Pokemon just in case he fails. As this important detour comes to a close, we head back to Northern Unova, and with one last battle with Bianca out of the way, find ourselves atop Two Blind Bridge, where Getsis is awaiting to threaten our commitment to becoming the hero this region needs. It's during this speech that he reveals his true intentions to Team Plasma, and if you've been following the clues, then the twist that Getsis is the true mastermind behind everything, including N's abysmal outlook on humanity, isn't the surprise he's hoping for. It turns out that almost since his birth, Getsis has been grooming N to become the fabled hero, and boasts about how with the influence of Zekrom or Reshiram at his side, as well as the necessary power afforded to him by the Guardian Dragon, N will slowly persuade more and more of the population to release their Pokémon, until the pure force that is public opinion makes sure every last person gives in to Team Plasma's will. And once the vast majority have pulled a Bye Bye Butterfree, he and his minions will use their strongest Pokémon to become the de facto gods of Unicorn. Once he's completed this monologue, you'll find yourself amongst yet another crowd observing the hypocritical tyrant during a Team Plasma rally in Opelousas City. This leads directly into a meetup with Drayden and Iris, two of Opelousas' premier trainers, as well as... Alder! Aren't you supposed to be battling for the fate of the world right now? Like, when you left the museum, did you decide to fly halfway to the league instead of just taking a direct flight, or... Whatever, I guess. Regardless, with an affinity for Dragon-type Pokémon, both Drayden and Iris have a bit of a personal stake in the fate of the world, as they're justifiably upset over Getsis' influence on the legendary dragons being used as tools to warp people's hearts. And as it turns out, they're also the toughest gym leaders found in Unova, which means you've got to defeat Drayden in black and Iris in white version if you want to gain access to the Pokémon League and put a stop to N once and for all. Upon obtaining your eighth and final badge, you'll run into some old friends, who along with providing you with a Master Ball, some revives, and a battle, thanks Sharon, we'll wish you luck against your upcoming duel with N. After this, the only thing left standing in your way are eight tedious gates, the infamous Victory Road, and finally the Elite for themselves, who shockingly enough have no distinctive order this generation. You can tackle each and every member in whichever fashion you choose, and though it does take a bit of the overall challenge away, these trainers are still just as strong as any previous iteration, and the experience itself is both innovative and way more streamlined, which makes for a refreshing take on the stale trope. But for posterity's sake, the four members this time around are Sean Paul, a ghost-wielding author, 
Grimsley, a pale gambler and master of dark types, the impatient psychic user Caitlyn, who, fun fact, actually made her debut as a member of the Battle Frontier throughout Generation 4, seriously, look it up, and finally, Alder's apprentice and fighting type guru Marshall, who can pack quite a wallop if you're not ready. Personally, my team had the most trouble with Grimsley, but they're all within the same level and should pose a similar challenge no matter which order you decide to proceed with. And after the fourth and final member is defeated, you're finally able to climb the champion's waylord sized staircase where you'll find Alder awaiting your arrival. Except, he's lost. Yup, as hinted at multiple times while going up against the lead, and has already stormed his way through the entire Elite Four. And as we rush towards the scene, it's clear that Unova's champion has succumbed to the overwhelming powers of the troubled boy and his legendary partner. And if that wasn't dire enough, N unknowingly shifts Getsus' plans into overdrive as he summons Team Plasma's grandiose castle from the League itself. And as he heads inside, he asks you to awaken the stone and put your conflicting viewpoint to the test in one final battle. Before you're able to catch up, however, you're intercepted by six of the seven sages, who, on Getsus' orders, have been tasked with ensuring that you never make it to the new champion. But just when all hope seems lost and it appears that Unova is doomed, they appear. Nearly every single gym leader across the region have banded together and arrived at the League to assist you in ensuring the future is protected from Plasma's corruption. And with that, they urge you to go on ahead as they dispose of the pesky sages. This moment is outstanding for a number of reasons, but mostly because it unifies everything you've been doing along the way into one climactic moment. Unlike past regions, the strongest trainers from coast to coast unite in order to protect the people and places they love, and in doing so, make every character interaction and badge one feel that much more special as a result. Except apparently Silent Killian Press, who I guess we're working double that night, Anyways, with that distraction out of the way, our hero is free to make their way through the castle until they encounter Getsus, who surprisingly just gloats about his plan coming to fruition and actually pushes you to challenge N in the next room. And once you arrive, it's on. N talks about his ideals one last time as he summons his legendary partner, and as the battle's about to commence, our protagonist's light or dark stone begins to glow as Zekrom or Reshiram is finally unleashed to combat his draconic counterpart. Now you've got to capture your very own legendary Pokemon in order to earn your role as the opposing hero, and once you've succeeded, it's time to take down the new champ and put an end to Team Plasma's madness for good. As a substitute for the traditional champion battle, you can bet that N is no walk in the park, and to my surprise, he had a varied and well put together team for a guy who hates making Pokemon battle. But he's no Cynthia, and when his final Pokemon faints, you can finally breathe once again, because Getsus arrives on the scene and showers N with a disturbing amount of emotional abuse for his loss. He also reveals during this tirade his true intentions to both N, as well as eventually Alder and Sharon, and it soon becomes clear that this demented soul, who also happens to be N's foster father, has an insatiable god complex, and essentially wants to be the only person to wield the destructive powers of Pokemon. He used the sympathetic people of Unova, used his organization, and even used his friends and family like Pawns in order to achieve these self-serving dreams, and now that they've evaporated before his very eyes, he'll use his personal team of disgustingly strong pocket monsters to eliminate everyone in the room. And so, we've reached the true final boss in this deranged sociopath, and despite a tough battle that includes his infamously underleveled Hydrogen, it turns out Getsus isn't as infallible as he believes, and with his defeat and subsequent arrest, Unova is finally free of Team Plasma's grip once and for all. Afterwards, still in shock, N contemplates what it means to be a hero, and also the value and consequences of sharing and accepting the ideas of others, even if they're not the same as his own. He laments that ever since he met our protagonist and observed the bonds between them and their Pokémon, as well as their friends, he knew he didn't have what it takes to become the true hero of Unova, and needs to take some time to discover who he really is and what Pokémon actually desire. And with one last fantastic POV shot, he urges the player to believe in themselves and the dreams they aspire towards as he flies off with his partner and the game reaches its narrative end. Of course, to become the true champion of Unova, you're going to have to make your way through some post-game content and challenge both the Elite Four and Alder one more time. But aside from some loose threads involving the Seven Sages and a few other characters, that's Black and White's overall story, and man oh man is it a long one. There's an obvious reason that this generation is referred to as the most JRPG-like amongst the core series of games, and that massive storyline is the major culprit. Practically every single town, bridge, route, or pathway has some form of character interaction or exposition dump to move the plot along, and though it can chug along at a slow pace once in a while, story-wise this was a massive improvement over all previous generations, and it's clear to many that this was the main focus when Game Freak created these works. 
Now, I can see why some people are turned off by black and white, as the focus on story does have noticeable consequences on other important players within the game. But personally speaking, I believe the attention to story is something that helps make this gen stand out. It's got its very own identity and charm, and though the amount of exposition dumping and dialogue can get quite annoying and even condescending for those who love exploration, I don't think anyone can deny that all these details create the most lived in and believable world to date. The characters are beaming with personality, the stakes seem more personal than ever, and everything feels much more unique, with small plot points and characters actually having a payoff, like the Jimmy Your moment I mentioned earlier. Does the content of the story have its weaknesses and flaws? Absolutely, and I'll discuss them in full within the other section of this review. However, for the first time possibly ever, the series feels like it's embracing the fact that these games are RPGs, and in that sense, I believe that with an already used combat system and the technology to bring their creation to life, Game Freak strive to deepen the stories they tell, and if that was their goal, then they absolutely succeeded. It. It's no Final Fantasy or anything, else, but it's a massive step forward for such a notoriously safe series, and I'd like to discuss the parts that really work as we move into the next section. With such a rich storyline, it's more of a challenge than ever to pick out one particular theme that encompasses Generation 5. But if I had to go on instinct alone, I'd say that the most central message revolves around conflict. This is reflected in both the obvious, such as the whole truth versus ideals debate that pops up throughout most of the game's confrontations, as well as the masked up Pokemon themselves, but this theme can also be found in more discreet ways, such as Bianca and Sharon's personal struggles, as well as the Guardian trio of Unova being fighting. Conflict is everywhere in these games, and although it's much more difficult to design a region's Pokemon around a heavily philosophical theme, rather than something more tangible like mythology or nature, I think the Game Freak's intent was to have these new creatures, as well as the setting, be in conflict with the very traditions players have come to expect. These more abstract themes play out in ways I could have never imagined back when the franchise was still in its infancy, and with multiple viewpoints to choose from and some pretty complex questions being posed, at least me wondering if perhaps now 15 years into the franchise, Game Freak were internally at war with their original vision for the series, and these untraditional and polarizing games were the result. Now, personally, I enjoy this colder world, and I think that besides a few missteps, particularly towards the climax, Black and White featured the best plotline out of any generation thus far, with potentially one exemption, but we're still ages away from talking about those titles. I've mentioned this already, but I think it's worth repeating that because of its massive story, this world feels connected, with nearly every character or locale having a reason to exist that makes sense within the narrative it's crafted. Even though Team Plasma's goal is, at its core, identical to Team Rocket's, the steps they take to achieving it makes it feel more impactful when they get there. Do I think it's a bit of a cop-out that just as the tension's rising, gets us revealed that Team Plasma is irredeemably evil, making your choice to stop them ironically black and white? Why, yes I do, and I'll discuss that a bit more in depth during the content. But for the most part, this story poses a lot of abstract questions and views that have no definitive answer. Is it wrong to essentially capture and make Pokemon fight for our benefit? Does striving to achieve one's goals make them narrow-minded and blind to others' opinions and criticism? And in the case of N, can we grow beyond our natures and mistakes to become better? There's ambiguity and purpose here that's beyond your typical Pokemon adventure, and despite choosing to play it safe with a predictable ending, if you've been paying attention during your playthrough, Black and White will leave you pondering a lot more than just why there's a Pokemon made of garbage. However big this story is though, at the end of the day it owes a lot to another one of Gen 5's most revered additions, which is its cast of fully realized characters. Pokemon Black and White have the best all-around character writing I've ever seen in a main series game. Even if the other incarnations have had better overall rivals like Silver or outstanding champions like Cynthia, Gen 5 has no weak links when it comes to its supporting cast. For example, before getting into some of the heavy hitters, let's just focus on Professor Juniper, the very first character we're introduced to. Unlike many of her former plant named peers, we're able to paint a fairly detailed portrait of what her life outside of the lab is like, and even get an understanding of what drives her forward as a person. She's a kind individual who instinctively trusts those around her, she seems to be confident in herself and her abilities despite at times being compared to or overshadowed by her famous father, and rather than simply reacting to and being affected by the game's evil organization, she actually takes charge and attempts to persuade N regarding his stance on Pokemon while doing work within the field. And oftentimes we learn these traits and viewpoints not because she tells us, but because she shows us, or because others help to inform her personality. She's kind and trusting because she sees Bianca struggling with her limitations and sympathetically takes her under her wing. 
She demonstrates confidence in the way that she approaches Aang's presumptuous views by sticking up for her life's work and engaging him with her own ideals, despite his resistance. And through her father, we get a sense of what drove her to study Pokemon in the first place, and you can imagine the struggles and benefits of living up to Sandra's legacy. And that's just the professor. When it comes to gym leaders, almost every one of them get multiple moments to shine. Through having careers outside of their lead work, we gain a greater sense of their contrasting personalities, as well as their motivations. Lenore is a no-nonsense Clay is a blue-collar businessman who makes sure he's on the winning end of any deal. Iris is a well-meaning young girl who wants to protect her friends at all costs. I mean, I can't deny that some of them get more development than others. In particular, I think the Stryphon trio and Bryson get the short end of the stick just due to where their battles take place plot-wise, but it's amazing to see almost each and every leader interact with other supporting characters, with the world around them, and of course with each other. And it's in part to this coexistence they establish throughout your adventure that you begin to appreciate Unova and its many quirks. The Elite Four, however, is a bit of a missed opportunity. Despite not having a real battle until way after the game's initial ending, Alder is clearly a character with a lot of history and love poured into it. It's revealed that what Sharon mistook for laziness was actually Alder aimlessly searching for meaning after his partner Pokemon fell ill and passed away, which is an intriguing concept that makes this guy more relatable than your typical champion. However, this approach is a double-edged sword as it makes the true final boss of the game feel more frail and aloof than those in the past. And as poignant as it is in how it visually reflects his loss, this decision as well as the decision to make Getsis the final boss narratively does make Alder feel more forgettable than a few of his peers. That being said though, he is the most fleshed out and sympathetic champion we've had yet, and as a character he's a solid addition to the main cast. Unfortunately, I can't say the same about the actual Elite Four. Outside of the league, Marshall gets a small moment with Sharon during the post-game, but other than that, these guys are the blandest roster of boss trainers I think we've ever had. As the various gym leaders in Team Plasma were given more of a spotlight, Grimsley and the others disappointingly fell to the wayside, which was a sad but necessary sacrifice in order to make the endgame more climactic. I do, however, think the decision to let the player choose which order they want to approach the league was genius, as it now allows for more strategy and can make each subsequent playthrough feel more unique. Oh, also, the various animations as you approach each member are ridiculously well made. But now, moving on to the rivals, I find myself sort of torn. On one hand, both Sharon and Bianca have incredible standout moments at various points throughout this game, and I love where they aren't bystanders throughout your adventure. These two, who are purposely made to be exact opposites, both develop into strong characters in their own respective ways. However, for some strange reason, compared to the rivals of other generations, there's no denying that they don't have the same instant memorability. I feel like the only explanation for this is that in a sea of wonderful and well-defined characters, they're just unable to rise above some of the more truly enigmatic figures such as Ed. This of course in no way makes them bad. In fact, replaying this game has made me fall in love with each of their personalities, and you better believe that when Bianca finally stood up for herself to her overbearing dad, I was right there with her, reveled in every triumphant word. And I guess that's sort of the thing when it comes to these rivals, it's that they're not really rivals at all, they're your best friend. Whereas a rival is someone you build up in your mind, whether it's through fear, respect, hatred, or some other deep-seated emotion, they become larger than life. But typically friends, though more important, are more of a constant presence in one's life and likely don't take on the same antagonizing force that a traditional rival might. And I think it's because Bianca and Sharon play the role of friends so well that they often get lost in the shuffle, despite being some of my favorite characters in the game. However, like most of the internet, I believe N to be the most complicated and probably the best overall rival in black and white. Also, for the record, complicated doesn't necessarily translate to good, it just, in this case, is something that makes N stand out in the crap. As Gensis is a adopted son, N has lived a life of luxury and authority no doubt, but it's also clear from the start that this upbringing is in direct conflict with who he is. And as we learn towards the end of the game, it's a point of contention between the boy and his father. Harassed and emotionally abused his entire life, N was kept away from those who could influence him and his gifts in a positive way for his entire childhood. He was sheltered, lonely, and had the bizarre gift of being able to understand the hearts of Pokemon, but not people, which made him the perfect pawn in Getsis' wicked game. And after arguing with all of those who rejected his and Team Plasma's plans until the very end, he finally learned the entire truth and is left feeling shocked and betrayed that his entire life has been a lie. He's the furthest thing from evil, but the choices he made and the things he's done were all for nefarious purposes. And the worst part is, he feels he's now betrayed both humanity and the Pokemon he thought he knew so well, leaving him caught between the two worlds. If any one character in Generation 5 best represents the central themes of 
conflict its end. And despite how sad his story is, he picks himself up and strives to at least find the right reasons to do better and atone for his sins, which is the reason I think so many people adore him. He's sympathetic, he's depressingly relatable, he's got a pretty iconic partner Pokemon, and most importantly, he's a symbol of hope. And despite being so conflicted about his past, he embraces the future with open arms, and in doing so, leaves an impact rivaling Blue himself. But of course, we can't discuss natural Harmonia Gropius, and yep, that's his name, without also talking about this generation's fiendish organization, Team Plasma. After Gen 4's deliciously sinister Cyrus, Getsu and his band of hooded outcasts had enormous shoes to fill. And despite the previously mentioned cop-out, I think overall they surpassed Galactic on every game that's come before. There's many reasons why, for me, Plasma keeps the cake, but the most important one is how realistic they actually are. We've all seen the memes of how they're basically a fictionalized version of our world's overbearing protest, but that only adds to my point. In the same ways that various humanitarians battle for animal rights and against other unjust causes humanity may be guilty of, it's logical to believe that if creatures like Pokemon did exist, we'd see these organizations naturally evolve to take on those who profit from their exploitation. And that's where Team Plasma comes in. They're meant to raise these ethical questions and make the player feel conflicted when having to battle other people who might simply have a different way of thinking. Again, Game Freak doesn't let the player go crazy with all of this uncertainty as they make sure almost from the start you see Team Plasma for what they truly are so that you never feel too bad about shutting them down. At the end of the day, this is a group of thugs who harass and bully their youth in order to make their dreams come true. And despite Game Freak neutering their potential in order to make clear-cut villains, Plasma is the type of evil team that gives the player immense pleasure in taking them down and thwarting their plans, which make for battles with higher stakes throughout the campaign. And of course, their leader, like Cyrus before him, is one twisted man. Getsus is a textbook psychopath in every sense of the word, and to the best of my recollection, he's also the first big bad who threatens to personally eliminate the player in a fit of rage. He's arrogant, he's selfish, and he's unsettlingly smart, with a plan for world domination that utilizes the mass opinion of people rather than sheer power alone to force his new world. To me at least, this is what sets Getsus apart from the other two leaders we've opposed in the past. He's not this weird loner, but rather a charismatic figure who charms and manipulates his way into the hearts of the masses, and even his own organization. Making any figurehead, though tragic for our foil, is unnaturally brilliant for a person who secretly craves the spotlight. And though anyone with half a brain can see the twist coming long before it occurs, it's still a surprise when after you take down N, he reveals himself as the game's true final boss. And with such a ridiculous team and a pseudo-legendary mascot of his very own, it makes him stand out in ways that no other Prime Leader has before. My one and only complaint with Getsis, disregarding the lackluster world domination thing, is that he's maybe a little too evil for the sake of being evil. Make no mistake, this is a terrifying individual who is given dimension via his relationship to Team Plasma and his son. I just think it would have been slightly more interesting if we had some real motivation for why he's such an abusive tyrant to everyone around him. And in that way, I think I still have to give the edge to Cyrus as my favorite Pokemon villain, albeit slightly. Also, upon booting the game up post credits for the first time, it's revealed that both Getsis as well as the other sages have escaped and gone on the run. These sages, though difficult to find, can be apprehended. However, Getsis is nowhere to be found, which is sort of anti-cathartic for such a cruel man to have no repercussions at all. Of course, a sequel would arrive not too long after Black and White, but at the time players didn't know this, so it likely left more than a few people with their feelings. Anyways, now that we've taken care of most of the story beats and characters, let's get into the more abstract positive Gen 5 option. And at the forefront is the ridiculously great design. Now I know that millions of players around the world were praying that we'd finally get to play a 3D Pokemon game this time around. But honestly, by the first gym, I couldn't care less because these games are downright gorgeous. It's mind-boggling to me that Black and White use what's essentially just a more refined version of Gen 4's DS engine, and make no mistake, they're squeezing everything they possibly can out of it here, and it shows. No matter where you go throughout this region, something is always happening on screen. Whether it's water crashing down around you, a thunderstorm flashing against a vast grey sky, or something as simple as the wind blowing a patch of grass on Route 1, this sense of motion helps immerse the player immediately into this cinematic world. And speaking of cinematic, the sprite work, 3D modeling, and battle animations found in this game are just stunning. Everything here is rendered with bold black lines and tops with the brightest of colors to create what can only be described as a work of virtual art. The background scroll as the battle chugs along and with dynamic camera angles to emphasize the action and changes within the music to reflect the battling conditions, there really isn't ever a dull moment. 
I could seriously gush about the battle interface and how these games love playing with perspective all day long, but this review is already crazy and I've still barely scratched the surface of what makes them so important. Now, moving along to... Well, movement, compared to the disparate progression through Platinum, Gen 5 is a breath of fresh air when it comes to pace. There is always something important happening within the game's narrative, and even when there isn't, other improvements like revamped gym puzzles help to ensure the player won't stop playing in the house. Focus centers and marts have been seamlessly combined, TMs are reusable for the first time ever, HMs are used far more sparingly than in previous generations, at least in the main campaign, and with one glaring exception involving the Relic Castle, backtracking is kept at a minimum. I mean, I love the Sinnoh region, but I know I'm not the only one who always hates traversing Mount Coronet and its many hidden pathways throughout that journey. But, in all fairness, black and white, though practically free of pointless backtracking, do suffer from onslaughts of exposition dumps that can at certain points become obnoxious. There are times where you'll meet so many new characters and have so much exposition thrown at you that you may lose track of the task at hand, which, although in my opinion isn't as cool as some of Platinum's worst moments, is still a major reason why this pacing is far from perfection. Another new addition that helps with grinding is the introduction of two new battle types. Of course, because triple and rotation battles are virtually non-existent throughout the main storyline, they don't help with the pacing all that much, but the odd late game triple battle, which are like double battles but bigger, is a lot of fun. And eventually when you finally do get to experience rotation battles, you'll likely have a good time with them as well. They're sort of like rock, paper, scissors, but with various combinations of Pokemon, and when you do successfully predict your opponent's moves and land that super effective hit, I can't deny how good it is. Now, whether it was because of the hardware or because they were just being too gimmicky, gameplay quickly did away with both of these new battle types. But regardless if you missed them or not, it's fair to say that at the very least they add something distinctive to Generation 5. Another thing I think Gen 5 gets right is the way that it makes use of its post-game content. As mentioned earlier, upon starting up your save file post-credits, you'll be greeted by Loki. Yep, that one, who needs your assistance in order to track down the remaining stages across the universe. He also gives you a fishing rod, for some reason, which is honestly the funniest moment in the entire game, so it's all good. Now, when it comes to this side quest, personally, I think it's kind of lame that all the stages got away in the first place, but admittedly, it's because of this post-game mission and the sense of closure it brings that you'll be enticed to explore the rest of the universe. For example, pretty much right off the coast of Route 1, there's an entirely new area where you'll not only encounter Rude, but also battle more experienced trainers as well as pick up some seriously helpful items. This turns out to be pretty important because if you remember, although you beat the Elite Four, you technically never beat Alt. So therefore you are the champion, but it's sort of questionable considering you bypassed having to battle the Stoic Adventure. Unfortunately though, with a team consisting of Pokemon level 75 and higher, your post gets as pocket monsters likely aren't going to even make it to Alt. And so, as you round up the last few stages and explore the region more thoroughly, you'll find your team and experiences growing to overcome the vast difference in skill. Personally, I don't know if I totally agree with forcing the player to do all of the post-game stuff in order to become the undisputed champion of the universe, but I will say it's a damn clever incentive to do so. It's also not too bad if you'll run into tons of old and familiar Pokémon now that you've acquired the national best, as well as some cool side quests and familiar faces to make your experience more satisfying. Some of the best post-game elements include exploring the underwater castle to get filthy rich, running into and battling Cynthia, who's still as tough as ever, and of course going out and catching all of the legendary Pokémon the region has to offer. Although with the exception of Kirim and Landorus, you could technically add them all to your team before taking down Anna's Pokémon League. You can also now gain entrance to the Pokémon Transfer Map, which enables you to download any Pokémon from Gen 4 via an adorable little minigame. Of course, there is one glaring omission from the usual post-game lineup, but I'll delve into that during the next game. Overall though, despite maybe not having as much to do post-game-wise as Platinum or the Jojo Remix, Pokemon Black and White's post-game feels far more meaningful in the way it encourages you to explore. There's a bit of backtracking necessary sure, but for the most part, you can discover Unova's secrets and travel city by city in a natural fashion until you're ready to head back to the new 4 for your day with all So in that way, it's not the best post-game we've ever had, but in my opinion, it's definitely the most rewarding, and for whatever reason, it sort of reminds me of a larger and more intricate set of the islands. And now that I've covered the basics of our end game, we can finally delve into Unova as a whole, and unsurprisingly, there's a lot to cover here too. Now, the good news is, I've already spoken at length about how the various characters, pacing, and graphics help shape a region that feels incredibly connected, so I won't prattle on about that too much. I will, however, say that I really admire the scope of this world, and though it falls short in a few places, overall many of these settings blew me away. Unova, likely because it's based on the United States, features a far more industrialized look than many of its Japanese and Spanish counterparts. 
It's got a massive cityscape that's honestly too big for its own good, construction happening everywhere, breathtaking bridges galore, and heck, even its iconic forest is both man-made and natural elements, marrying the two into something we've never quite seen. I feel like this is yet another reason why these titles are often looked down upon by those who swear by brighter generations such as 3. But with awe-inspiring landmarks like the giant chasm, marvelous bridge, and of course charged stone cave, is things are not looking that far. And as if these settings weren't creative enough on their own, Game Freak decided to take things even further by giving us our first seasonal cycle in the world of Pokémon. With every month that passes within the real world, the season will shift accordingly in-game, and with each new change comes a new variety, and even a few secrets here and there. Now, sadly, during the recording period for this review, I only got to experience spring and summer, which in my opinion don't hold a candle to the visual delights of fall and winter. However, that in and of itself only adds to the replayability of these games, and once again brings a distinctive element that makes Unova its own place, untainted by past influences. Though I didn't even mention that there are also a few duds and a handful of unmemorable cities that sort of all blend together along the way. And although I like the idea of Opelousin City being futuristic in black and more historic in white, I sort of hate that you only get to experience one. Small little gripes, but still worth bringing up so that you guys know Unova could be even better. But of course, no new region is complete without its accompanying soundtrack, and if you guys weren't sure by now, just know that I'll never be too critical of any Pokemon OST because there's rarely anything to complain about. In fact, in my opinion, Gen 5 strikes that perfect balance of both brilliant melodies and natural ambience that a more refined region requires. It's upbeat and charming when it needs to be, but also at times perfectly encapsulates the gravity of the characters and their personal struggles, and I think overall it captures a slightly foreign sound that's expected of such an unusual setting. Also, you guys would crucify me if I didn't bring up that this game gave the world some of the saddest video game music ever produced. There's some heart-wrenching themes here, but by far the game's most popular track, Emotion, takes the cake. Being on YouTube, where it's basically a meme at this point, I've become a little desensitized to it. However, that doesn't change the fact that it's an important piece in the series' symphonic history, and along with some of my other personal favorites like Route 10, Celestial Tower, Victory Road, and Ends Castle Bridge, I would honestly rank this soundtrack as the best of the DS era. Mmm, that wasn't a remake, of course. So between the sound, the set pieces, and the connectivity, where does Unova rank overall within the series' best regions? Well, once again, your opinion will be vastly different than my own, but personally, I feel that with its unrivaled variety and unparalleled diversity, it falls just below Heart Gold and Soul Silver's version of Johto, but it's on par with Generation 3's natural environments. I think in many ways, Unova shares a lot of similarities with Hoenn in that their worlds don't only exist to be explored, but as thematic anchors that help inform nearly every feature found within them. Mind you, this isn't a distinctive trait of those specific regions, I just think that Generations 3 and 5 succeed the most in demonstrating their themes of nature and conflict respectively through their settings. I feel like on the whole, most people will instinctively praise more organic and pristine elements rather than those that are in direct confrontation with themselves, but I believe it takes a little extra spark of creativity to convey conflict through a physical world, and the varying places within it, and when you think of it in that way, Unova becomes even more impressive. So does this trend continue when it comes to this region's enormous amount of new Pokémon? Well, yes and no. New rosters are always a mixed bag every time around, but with such a massive influx of fresh faces, especially five generations in, there's bound to be some winners and some losers. As I've sort of already alluded to, the thematic elements of black and white do creep into the designs of a few of these newcomers, and you'll find many brilliant typing combinations such as Volcarona's glorious fire and bug pairing that shouldn't ever work, and yet result in some of the most memorable Pokémon we've had in a while. On the other hand, we also see plenty of conflict demonstrated through the physical designs of Pokémon, such as Archeops being based on a feathered serpent, or represented in constantly shifting forms like Deerling's seasonal variations. Of course, that doesn't mean every Pokémon here is some flash of genius in their form, but for now we're focusing on the positive, and among them we have creative creatures like our starters in their evolutions, Stoutland, Zebstrika, Gigalith, Excadrill, Adino, Levani, Scolipede, Crocodile, Darmanitan, the two fossils, Zerua and its evolution, Amolga, Excavalier, Galvantula, Ferrothorn, Electros, Gendalur, Aselgor, Haxorus, Golurk, Bisharp, Braviary, Hydrogen, and for my money, every legendary or mythical has something to offer, with the possible exclusions of Meloetta and the forces of nature, who, at least in these games, are lazy palette swaps of one design. Also, some of the most underrated types such as Bugs, Steel, and Dark got huge upgrades this time around, and unlike a few former generations, <coughs> Gen 2, 
You'll discover so many new Pokemon that you'll be hard pressed to finalize your team without being seduced by some stronger, cooler looking ally as you proceed through your initial playthrough. Ecstatic about your electrifying Galvantula? Well, not so fast because this Electros guy has solid stats and zero weaknesses. Think that Crocodile was the ultimate dark type for your team? That's a great choice, however, can I interest you in a pseudo-legendary dragon who happens to share that typing? Again, I know it's all subjective, but the fact that you have no choice but to rely on these 150 new Pokémon, as opposed to the beloved partners from the past, makes this campaign, in particular the battling, more engaging than it's been in years. And with so many inventive designs, you're bound to fall in love with at least a few of these creatures, who you may have passed up for an old favorite like Tutini if given a chance. So with so many damn fine additions, why on earth do people complain about Black and White's contributions even still today? Well, I have a few theories on the subject, but I feel like they may be better suited for our next session, where I get to share my thoughts on the shortcomings of this divisive generation. Question. When playing through an immersive RPG, would you rather A, take in the world at your own pace and forge a personalized quest that allows you to decide how you want to explore it, or B, hold your hand the entire campaign until it's numbered and tough to be known? If you answered B, then congratulations! Pokemon Black and White are likely going to be some of your favorite handheld games of all time, because my god is this game amazing. Now despite rabid portions of the fanbase arguing otherwise, this series has in fact never been the most open of RPGs. There are certainly times where you can switch things up or take a detour during your quest, with Gen 1 having a few prime examples of this type of freedom and how it's mapped into the app. But when it comes right down to it, in order to accommodate their story and ensure the players don't get too ahead of themselves, intentional boundaries and blockages show up in every region no matter how big or small. And unfortunately, as a trade-off for receiving the franchise's richest story yet, black and white sense of choice is all but removed. Of course, there are a few occasions sprinkled throughout where you can tackle a side quest or make things easier for yourself down the road by battling training. But for the most part, your journey is decided for you the second you hit your start, and the game will reveal itself to you beat by beat eliminating almost all chances to explore the world at your own leisure. Once again, this is nothing new and really it's time to graphic, no Pokemon game is going to play like the original Legend of Zelda or offer the style of freedom that a more robust RPG such as Chrono Trigger may enable. The problem with these particular incarnations stems from the constant hand-holding and immediate explanations that are forced upon the player with little to no ego. Virtually every time you enter a new room, exit a gym, discover a secret, or dispose of an enemy, some event or character will pop up that informs you exactly where to go next and what to do when you get there. You rarely get a break from these barrages of exposition, and although it can often do wonders for getting into a character's mindset or add immediacy to a situation, it's just too much and in some rare instances can even have the opposite. A few examples of this include the problem with Alder I mentioned in the story section, where because the developers wanted to make the player understand how manipulative Getsis was, it results in the champion seeming forgetful and lazy in his commitment to stop N at the Pokemon League. This is made even worse by the fact that we literally just spoke to Getsis prior to entering the city, so when we do arrive in Opelucid City, it almost seems repetitive. Another example of this redundancy is in Charstone Cave, where we meet the Shadow Tree and end upon entering, bump into Professor Juniper and Bianca not long after, then they show up a second time after like one or two trainer battles, which is then followed by another run-in with the Shadow Triad, who practically forced you to take the correct path downstairs. We then have to battle a few grunts towards the end before finally running into and battling N with the exit, where he has his world opinions with the Professor. And if that wasn't bad enough, before entering, we have an admittedly cool but overall superfluous moment with play, and upon exiting the cave, we immediately meet both Cedric and Skyla in this looking city. Somehow Game Freak made this small trek through a beautiful area feel like a brutal game of Red Leg Green. And although this is one of the more blatant examples of expositional abuse found in Black and White, this type of thing, albeit maybe not to the same magnitude, is found throughout your entire journey. However, as previously stated, the reason for this style of forceful handholding is because Game Freak aspired to do more with the story. And for every exemplary moment of character growth or cinematic triumph, we're given a repetitive text dump or grinding stoppage as a result. And at the end of the day, you've got to ask yourself if the greater emphasis on world building and a more robust story was a worthy trade off for more access to any choice. Personally, just on the merits of being something different, I found the price justifiable, but there's many who won't, and it's worth addressing because of that. 
Moving on to my most personal gripe by far, I think it's a shame that Game Freak felt the need to wrap up the storyline with such a neat bow. All of the burning questions Black and White ask are ultimately left hanging in favor of a clear cut ending. And although this is obviously another byproduct of being designed with children in mind, in hindsight, this was a bit of a misstep. Nowadays, Gen 5 is fondly remembered as being the most mature and melancholy of the entire series. And if the current direction and success of its recent entries is anything to go off of, then it could be a very long time until we're able to experience something quite as polarizing again. Black and white are thoughtful games, with more complexity than your run-of-the-mill Pokemon type. But by turning tail three quarters of the way through and making Getsus and his team just another troop bent on world domination, it ironically forces the developer's ideals onto the player in the same way that Team Plasma was judgmentally forcing their will onto the people of Unova. And in my opinion, when they filled in the blanks for you, they stopped this generation from ascending into something more provoking. And I believe that to gain commercial accessibility, Game Freak betrayed their own ambitions, which draw black and white from their full potential storylines. I know I'll take some flack for this particular bit of criticism because given their history and who they make their games for, asking for more is admittedly unfair. But remember, we're not talking about a franchise like Fire Emblem or Final Fantasy, where one wrong move could have wiped out the entire series. No, we're talking about Pokemon, one of the most iconic and successful franchises to ever exist. And at a time where Game Freak was aiming to shake up the status quo, it's hard not to wish that they'd gone even further. But moving on to something more universally accepted, I'd like to take a moment to address the small steps back the series took with Black and White and to the various battling alternatives found across Unicorn. Tell me, who thought musicals were a good replacement for Pokemon content? I'm aware that in all likelihood, the addition of musicals was an afterthought by the team, considering the amount of time and effort they were pouring into the story and presentation. But I have yet to meet another person who mourns the absence of these dress-up competitions in the late game. Oh, and speaking of long-gone additions, does anyone out there remember the Pokémon Dream World? I'm not going to spend much time on it here because the external website has been shut down for a few years now, so I've got little to no footage or recent experience to go off. But it was essentially Pokémon's answer to Neopets and a pretty decent way to get hidden ability Pokémon, as well as special skins from the sea gear, which was the vastly improved UI featured on the lower screen. I didn't bring up this improvement during the pro section due to its overall unimportance, but despite being attacked and using sea gear was a simpler way to connect and battle with other trainers, both locally and online, as well as connect to the aforementioned Pokémon Dream World site, although that last one also required a visit to Fennel at the game. So yeah, Sea Gear was a much needed addition and looked a thousand times better than Gen 4's interface, but the Dream World itself could have used some work. And for the record, I actually did use the website multiple times back in the day. So I'm not just aimlessly complaining that it was fun, but ultimately mediocre side to an already playing out Next on the docket, we have the often glossed over Battle Supplement, and yeah, this one's a bit of a mixed bag as well. Considering that there was no gray version, it's kind of a miracle we even got something for the diehard competitive fans out there, and black and white get bonus points for dramatically tying its design into the overall region's look. Where it falters is in its variety and in something even more. Despite the appearance of many different trains to do battle on, gone are the days of creative and troublesome challenges like the battle on. Instead, you can compete in single, double, mixed, and Wi-Fi battles, as well as the super versions of those first three types once the originals are beaten. And that's it. There's only two frontier brains, and amazingly, there aren't even trains for triple or rotation battles no matter how far you progress in the game. But the really unfortunate part is that, well, let's just say that there's a lot of imbalance when it comes to Gen 5's battling as a whole. Those of you who played competitively during this time likely remember how broken and chaotic some of these battles could be, and it's especially made difficult when facing an equally strong opponent and not in a satisfying sort of way. Many people believe that the sheer amount of ridiculousness that could be accomplished with a few key dragon types is the main reason why they eventually get a fairy typing in X and Y. And although there were far more pressing issues than an opponent's well-trained Haxorus, the point remains that Gen 5's competitive scene eventually got a little too overwhelming for most folks, and Gen 6 did a lot to correct it. Finally, now that we've gotten all of those negatives out of the way, let's dive into one of the largest areas of criticism these titles routinely receive as we take a look at some of the not-so-stellar Pokemon. I always found it sort of funny how Gen 1ers desperately hate on a lot of these designs with no awareness of how many of them work as parallels to their beloved Cantonian creations. For example, remember that one rock with a face on it that could only reach its final evolution via trade? Well, here's a slightly more creative version of that same Pokémon. Do you have warm, fuzzy feelings regarding a purple pile of sewage named Muck? Well, now you've got another bulky poison type with a similar theme involving mutated weight. Okay, fine, but in our day, we would have never fused multiple Pokémon together and called it an evolution, or just slap faces on food. Yeah, because Gen 1 did none of that. 
Look, I know I'm being harsh here, but can't we all just agree that when you get a massive roster of Pokemon like both Gens 1 and 5, there's bound to be some iconic additions, as well as some of the most ridiculous designs we've ever seen. And personally, I believe the only reason people hate on the 5th generation's roster is because a vast majority of them have less exaggerated eyes. I'm not kidding, when it comes to black and white, for whatever reason they toned down the expressiveness and made a majority of the creature's eyes look more proportional and realistic, which I think alienated a lot of people used to the classic Sugimori-esque designs from their childhood. This is by all means just a hypothesis, and maybe I'm just reaching for an explanation because I refuse to accept that the majority of these Pokemon are uninspired or clumsy. But aside from a few duds like Maractus, the Gothitaline, Cryogenol, and Alamola, I believe all of these Pokemon have something to offer in some form or another. But that's just my opinion having put 50 hours into this playthrough, and I think once again having a few disappointing designs is par for the course when it comes to the biggest roster of new Pokemon we've ever gotten at one single time. Mind you, I will admit that from an inspiration standpoint, it's clear that the team was in need of an overall, at least in terms of influence, as the majority of designs fall into the average category for me, with the great ones previously discussed in the process. There's only so many times you can play with the idea of a Pokeball-inspired evolution of the game, you know? Actually, add Fungus and Amoongus into that bad pile just for pure unoriginality. Come on guys, you can do better than Voltorb clones. Anyways, all jokes aside, that about does it when it comes to weaknesses. For the most part, the good definitely outweighs the bad, but as we've seen, there's a valid reason as to why these titles are so polarizing, and where you fall in terms of alignment all depends on what you believe makes a Pokemon game enjoyable. Oh, also, this is the smallest nitpick ever, but what the heck happened to the end credit sequence? I don't know if it was meant to be simple on purpose, but coming off of the Johto remake, it's just so boring. But anyway, if you're still with me after all of that, then please just stick around a little bit longer as we wrap things up with my version. So in the end, after finally overcoming Alder and rounding up all six stages, were these games as good as the life-changing masterpieces I conjured in my mind after my first playthrough all those years ago? Well, although I wouldn't use the word masterpiece to describe them, I do still feel they're every bit as engaging and refreshing as I remember. Pokemon Black and White may not be for everyone, and that's okay, but they're beyond special to me, and aside from a few remakes, I still feel like they're my personal favorite entry games of any generation. Sometimes certain products have a way of transcending every assumption of what we thought they could be, and with the most substantial story we've ever got in a Pokemon title, as well as some of the best fright work and cinematic presentation in a 2D game period, I sincerely believe that these contributions to the franchise possess this special sort of influence. Many of the Pokemon designs are hit and miss, and the sheer amount of story progression and accompanying dialogue all but remove the player's sense of freedom throughout the main campaign. However, it's my personal stance that these are side effects of aspiring to overcome and surpass familiar traditions and mechanics of the series, and I can't, in all good consciousness, penalize these titles too harshly for their attempt to be more, and to break away from many of the formulas we've all gotten accustomed to. Do they have faults? Indisputably, and I believe that in their search for accessibility, Game Freak stopped short of truly making these games something iconic. However, in the end, I'm so happy that rather than just resting on their laurels and waiting to simply just modernize past generations on the PS, we received something that clearly had an overwhelming amount of both thought and ambition for it. Without these efforts, we may have never known how grounded and conflicting Pokemon game could be. And for still holding up and being the most refreshing in the entire series, Pokemon Black and White received an A+. This is the one that I've been looking forward to replaying the most during this entire review series. And though it might not be the best for competitive battling, discovering secrets, or even shiny hunting, I was pleased to discover it still holds up not only as a video game, but as an experience that leaves you questioning both the truths and ideals of your own mindset, as well as the world around you. And if Game Freak was swinging for the fences, desperately trying to revitalize the long, comfortable series, then I believe that Generation 5 was the walk-off home run with the desperate need. Of course, as we all know now, our adventures in Unova weren't quite done yet, as we'd eventually get Pokemon Black and White 2, the first numbered sequels in the franchise's history. Funny enough, the original plan was actually to incorporate those games into this review, making a sort of Gen 5 mega review, but I'm not in the business of making long-winded documentaries, so I nicked that plan almost immediately. Actually, this review was a bit of a demon for me behind the scenes, and I really do hope that you guys enjoyed it. I put everything I had into making it something that I'm really proud of, even though it probably took longer than it was, so sorry about that. 
Either way, I'm still here, I'm still making videos, so please let me know your thoughts on this review and Black and White as a whole in the comment section below, and look forward to my review of Pokemon Black and White 2, hopefully sometime mid-summer 2018. That's the plan. Until then, though, have a fantastic day. Thank you from the bottom of my heart if you made it through this entire monster-sized video. And, as I always say, happy hunting day, Rhinos. I want to take a moment to thank everybody who waited patiently for this one while I was busy dealing with some stuff behind the scenes. I also want to give a huge shout out to my sponsors who allow me to continue doing this even when I don't post this video. Seriously, I could not do this without your guys' support. If you enjoyed the video, please consider leaving a like. And if you're new to this series and the channel as a whole, subscribe for both past entries and ones that haven't been created just yet. 2018 is poised to be another massive year, and I can't wait to make a bunch more videos that I've been waiting to record until this one was done. But until then, take care my friends. What up, friends? My name is Stan from Random Tens, and yes, it's finally here. Apologies to those who've been waiting, but things have been a little hectic behind the scenes, and with these particular videos, I want to give them the time they need, rather than rushing them out for the sake of consistency. And I'd forgotten how long Gen 4 can take if you try and do everything. But yeah, after two months of work, I'm finally ready to give my opinion on these beloved handheld games, and see if they're worthy of all that remake talk that's been going on for years now. Will they surpass Crystal and possibly even Emerald? Well, let's find out in this Gen 4 in-depth review. The Games After not only the global success of Ruby and Sapphire, but also the Gen 1 remakes, it was pretty much a guarantee that Game Freak would eventually get back on the proverbial saddle and give fans yet another adventure for the brand new Nintendo DS. And after a few years of waiting, Junichi Masuda and his team welcomed the world to the gorgeous Sinnoh region in the forms of Pokemon Diamond and Pearl. Despite these games releasing during what could be considered the franchise's weakest era, the series' rabid fanbase as well as the DS's global popularity led to Diamond and Pearl eventually outselling Ruby and Sapphire as the fifth best-selling titles on the system. At the time of their release, I was a pretty awkward teenager, and beyond playing the campaign quickly on my brother's copy of Diamond, I pretty much skipped this generation entirely. However, about two years later, the team created yet another sister version of the games in the form of Pokemon Platinum, which I didn't pick up until only last year at a flea market on the cheap. Dubbed the ultimate Pokemon version by Masuda himself, this massive game made many changes to the Sinnoh region, including superior Wi-Fi, more wild Pokemon, and some incredible post-game content. But despite all of these improvements, does Platinum live up to Masuda's promise? Is this the ultimate Pokemon version? Well, dust off your old DS and let's find out. The Story I want to preface the actual review by making it very clear that this is a review of Pokemon Platinum and only Pokemon Platinum. I know in my previous videos, I've done a few comparisons here and there between version exclusives. However, despite my love for Diamond and Pearl, it's my opinion that when it comes to Gen 4, Platinum isn't just a director's cut, it's the best version by a mile. This opinion may be controversial, but I feel like if you've owned this game, then you probably understand where I'm coming from. And with that little caveat out of the way, let's start at the very beginning. Like their predecessors, Diamond, Pearl, and Platinum are pseudo-reboots that serve as their own self-contained story. This time we begin in Tunisia, where our protagonist, Lucas or Dawn, depending on which gender you choose, are messing around with their childhood friend, Barry, and stumble upon the renowned Professor Rowan and his assistant while attempting to run through some tall grass. After a lot of talking and some admittedly funny dialogue between Barry and the Professor, Rowan decides to entrust our heroes with their first ever Pokemon. In Gen 4, your choices are between Turtwig, Chimchar, and Pokemon, with my heart forever belonging to the adorable Green Turtle. After you've secured your starter and battled Barry for the first time, you'll eventually stumble across a weird blue-haired man at Lake Verity. He talks to himself about Legendary, along with their new partner, set out to catch them all in order to assist the professor in his research of Pokemon Evolution. Not long after beginning your quest, you'll stumble upon Looker, a member of the International Police who's on the prowl for any suspicious grown-ups who may be hanging around. 
You see, there's a small cult-like group of people known as Team Galactic who all wear ridiculous outfits and sport bowl cuts who've been up to no good across Sinnoh. You'll learn that despite being odd, the group is seemingly harmless, and after another battle with Barry, you'll head east to Orberg City, where you can obtain your first gym badge from the rock Pokemon enthusiast, Rourke. One of the things I love about these games is how each town and each leader seem to have some sort of practical purpose, such as Orberg serving as a mining mecca, as I feel as it gives the entire region a lot more personality than Hoenn. Either way, once you've beaten Rourke, our hero will make their way through Eternal Forest in order to face off against Gardenia of Eternal City to collect their second badge from the Grass-type gym leader. It's also in Eternal City that you'll cross paths with Jupiter, the second of Team Galactic's commanders, with the first being Mars who is beaten between badges at the Valley Windworks on the way to Eternal Forest. Regardless, once you take down Jupiter, it's time to proceed on quite a journey before you eventually end up in Heartland City, where you can partake in Super Contests as well as grab your third gym badge from the Ghost-type Masters fan team. Seriously though, it'll take you a while between obtaining the Forest and Relic badges, so be prepared for tons of battles along the way. Anyways, after passing through Salacian Town and heading north, you'll eventually find yourself in Vail City. It's here in this gambling town that you'll find Team Galactic headquarters. However, you'll be turned away at the entrance and instead you'll take on the fighting type gym leader Maylene in order to add the cobble badge to your growing collection. After besting Maylene, you'll take on some goons from Team Galactic in order to help the professor's assistant retrieve their Pokedex. And after a quick chat with Looker, it's become apparent that perhaps Team Galactic may not be as harmless as they initially seem. Despite his apprehensions, Looker sets you on a path towards Pastoria City, where you'll come across a shifty looking member of Team Galactic, as well as the one and only Crasher Wake. This legendary water type user is the city's gym leader, as well as Barry Sensei in the art of everything Pokemon, and once defeated, he'll reward your efforts with the Fen Badge and some manly words of advice. However, during your battle, that suspicious member of Team Galactic set off a bomb in the Safari Zone, and so it's up to you to chase the fiend back up to Lake Valor, where you'll also run into your old friend Cynthia. Cynthia is an older trainer who seems to always appear when the player needs her most, and this time she offers the advice of her grandmother in order to help figure out what Team Galactic are up to at the lakes. And it's upon reaching Cynthia's grandmother in Celestitron that the game's real narrative is revealed, as you learn about the various legendary Pokemon in Sinnoh, as well as Battle Cyrus, Team Galactic's powerful leader. Yeah, remember that creepy guy from the beginning of the game? Turns out he's planning to capture the Lake Guardians, Mesprit, Azel, and Uxi, in order to obtain... something. But after he's defeated, Cyrus will retreat, and Cynthia's grandmother will point you towards Canalea Library where you can study up on Sinnoh's various myths and legends, as well as nab your sixth badge from the town's steel-type gym leader, Byron, who also happens to be Rourke's distant father. And after meeting up with Barry, Professor Rowan, and Lucas or Don in Kenner's library, a giant explosion will send you to investigate Lake Valor, where you'll face Commander Saturn, who successfully captured Valor's psychic-type guardian, Azure. Now it's up to you and Barry to head way north in order to save Uxie at Lake Acuity, and beat Snowpoint City's gym leader, Candace, in order to obtain your second badge. Unfortunately though, by the time you're able to reach the Lake's Guardian, Team Galactic has already captured them and sent them back to their base in Veilstone, where you'll need to rescue all three legendary Pokemon in order to save the world from Cyrus' evil plot. It's after you've traveled to Team Galactic HQ that you realize Cyrus and his ponies have been doing some horrific experiments on Pokemon in order to learn about their evolution properties so that Cyrus may create his own perfect world from the energy harness. It's sort of a perversion of the exact research that Rowan does, and it really helps cement this cult of criminals as the most disturbing and vile organization yet. And so, you must clear the warehouse, free the Lake Guardians, and follow Team Galactic to the historic Spear Pillar on Mount Coronet in order to prevent Cyrus from obliterating the current universe. Once there, however, Cyrus reveals his true colors and attempts to summon a being of pure energy, only to find himself at the mercy of something much more sinister. And it's here that players encounter the game's mascot, Giratina, in the Distortion World, which today may be one of the most interesting and confusing areas in all of Pokemon. However, after a grueling battle with both Cyrus and Giratina, the former will concede defeat, and with that, the day is saved from total annihilation once again thanks to an 11-year-old kid. And so, with Cyrus beaten and Team Galactic no more, the only thing left to do is for our hero to obtain the 8th and final badge from Sunny Shore's gym leader Volkner, and officially take on the Elite Four at Sinnoh's renowned Pokemon League. However, as per tradition, you'll have one final intense battle with Barry before taking on the challenge, and once beaten, he'll finally admit that perhaps he's still got a little training to do. And with all obstacles demolished and all battles won, it's time for the ultimate showdown between our hero and the Elite Four. First up is the bug-type user, 
who's admittedly a bit of a pushover if you have at least one fire or flying type member in your party. Next we have this region's token old person in Bertha and her ground type team. She can be a bit tricky, but she's certainly no Flint, who's the third trainer in this gauntlet. This fire type specialist offensive team will make you forget all about his silly red afro as you try to douse the fire in his heart. His words, not mine. And finally, last but not least, you'll take on William, a psychic type master who will leave your team in shambles if you've got no special defense. William, in my opinion, is the first true threat of the Elite Four, but with enough patience and speed, you'll finally move on to the Sin Elite Champion, the one and only Cynthia. Yes, as almost everyone here could guess, Cynthia is Gen 4's champion, and along with being debatably the most popular champion in the entire series, she's also got one heck of a team. For most folks, it's her perfect Garchomp and level 60 Lucario that pose the most problems, but overall, she's an absolute monster for training, so make sure you're prepared before taking on the league for this member alone. Either way, when her last Pokemon finally calls it quits and you've emerged victorious, Cynthia will admit defeat and confer her title as champion to you. And with a visit from Professor Rowan and a trip to the Hall of Fame, you've officially beaten this long and difficult game, despite still having ways to go after the credits roll. Although, beyond a surprisingly touching reunion between Barry and his frontier brain father Palmer, I think it's best to save the post-game stuff for the other sections, as most of it's gameplay related rather than story. So what did I think of Platinum's narrative? Well, despite starting slow, I liked it. Actually, compared to Gen 3's, I would say I possibly even loved it. I feel like Barry is an excellent rival with a decent character arc, and I believe Team Galactic is used in a strong way that brings together great characters, epic locales, and of course, a little mythology and great storytelling to boot. Now, obviously, I'll go into more detail in the next section, but in summation, Generation 4's narrative is probably the best so far in terms of these reviews, and I feel like these games are where Masuda and his team really started hitting their stride as world builders. But for more on all that, let's jump right into the pros, shall we? The Pros As I've stated in previous reviews, virtually every core generation of Pokemon games have particular threads or thematic motifs that run through them. And although Gen 4 may be the most difficult to place, to me at least the major theme is one of belief. I'm aware that many will point to Sinnoh's vast mythology and history as the game's underlying threats, and for the most part, I agree. I just think that they serve the larger narrative of believing in something even when hope seems lost. Whether it's as simple as Barry learning to believe in himself and his Pokémon, or the more literal interpretation of believing in creation and something greater than ourselves, Gen 4 is chock full of allegories to religion, faith, and of course spirit, and yet somehow they manage to do this subtly without making an uncomfortable experience for the player, which is pretty remarkable. Heck, the entire plot culminates in Cyrus's despicable true nature, summoning the series equivalent of... Well, you can figure it out. But throughout it all, Cyrus believes in his actions, that he's doing the right thing, despite how horrific and selfish it may be. He truly feels that the world has become devoid of beauty, and believes the only way to pack the tracks is to begin again with humanity devoid of spirit, which is pretty messed up for a kid's game. And while we're on the topic of their leader, let's finally talk about one of my favorite parts of Gen 4, Team Galactic. I really enjoy how the developers sort of tricked us into believing that this group was somehow more bumbling than Team Rocket, only to reveal the true operation behind the curtain, which is by far the most sinister of any crime organization yet. Yes, the grunts are pretty laughable, and some of the conflicts can feel like padding, but with actual commanders like Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, as well as seriously creepy members like Sharon and Cyrus, these guys mean business, and even better, they're actually memorable with a plan that makes sense. But dying away from story for a little, let's talk about the sole gameplay feature that makes this a winning gen for most competitive folks out there, the physical and special split. Praise Arceus, this one small addition to the series changed everything for the better, as now a Pokemon's moves have nothing to do with the typing, but rather if they hit you physically or not. So moves like Thunder Punch were finally physical, and moves like Signal Beam were finally special. Which meant that in conjunction with things like natures and abilities, you could truly personalize your Pokémon and how they battled even further. And while we're on the topic of gameplay, I'm throwing this out here right now. In my personal opinion, Pokémon Platinum is the best and most fun battling experience I've ever had in the franchise to this day. So much so that replaying Platinum has actually gotten me re-energized to take up competitive play in Gen 7, which is something I've neglected for a few generations now. Mind you, battles in Platinum can be rather slow due to the new engine, but honestly the refined and dare I say perfected system is enough to compensate for that small issue, and if you play these games for bragging rights, then this is your generation. 
Battling is fun, complex, and most importantly, engaging. And for the first time ever, you could take on friends and strangers across the world thanks to the global trade system in Google City. As expected, the introduction of Wi-Fi changed the entire series, and even in Generation 7, its legacy can still be felt. Finally, you could complete the Pokédex without using a link cable or a physical peripheral, and those willing enough could take on players from around the world to prove they were the best trainers alive. Now, unfortunately, as this was the first iteration of Wi-Fi into the series, the actual process was a bit shaky, and Gen 5 would make some much-needed refinements, but at the time, we didn't care, because this one new addition created hours of new and exciting replayable content. And along with internet access, the games also gave us our first touchscreen experience thanks to the DS's dual screen technology. This often unnoticed improvement in how you interact with the world around you was especially helpful while navigating the menu. And it also made for some fun additions, like the underground mining game as well as the Poketch, which allowed players to count steps, track roaming legendaries, and check the status of their Pokemon on the bottom screen as they played. Again, it's one of those things that we sort of take for granted now, but two screens was a really clever way of making the experience feel more immersive, and nowadays I can't imagine we'll ever get a core series game without some form of touch control. And now folks, it's time we get into my personal favorite aspects of Gen 4, starting with everyone's favorite rival, Barry. This blonde haired goofball is pretty much me in sprite form, as he's impulsive, wildly proud to a fault, and starts the game trying to immediately catch a legendary Pokemon. However, unlike me, he's actually pretty funny. In fact, Gen 4 as a whole has by far the most hilarious and at times surreal humor of any game yet, and between Barry and Looker, I found myself actually doing double takes throughout some of the more serious parts of the game. Most of all though, I love how confident Barry is in both himself and his Pokemon. Yes, he can be a little obnoxious at times, but this is a rival who, despite not being a total ass, still manages to be memorable and have a small arc. Unlike most characters in fiction, Barry starts off perhaps a little too confident and a little too hasty, but through experiences with his Poke friends and eventually listening and growing thanks to the advice of Crash and Wake and even Team Galactic, he evolves into a more well-rounded and more serious Pokemon trainer who just wants to make his father proud. And I think on some level, we can all sort of relate to that mentality. Now, let's talk about the post-game, and oh man, is there a lot to cover. Remember how I said that Emerald had the best post-game minus Gen 2's Kanto adventure? Well, I could not have been more wrong, because Pokemon Platinum's post-game is somehow even better. We're talking a revamped and frankly more accessible Battle Frontier, rematchable Gym Leaders and Elite Four, tons of legendary and rare Pokemon to capture, including both Dialga and Palkia, an entire resort area that only opens up after the initial story is completed, as well as one of the coolest twists ever in the form of Professor Oak himself. That's right, if you manage to see all 210 Pokemon in your Sinnoh deck, the original Kanto Professor will show up and not only upgrade your Pokedex to include all Pokemon thus far, he'll also give you access to the Pal Park, which will enable you to transfer your Gen 3 critters into Sinnoh via a fun minigame. On top of that, you'll also unlock Moltres, Articuno, Zapdos, Cresselia, and the remainder of the Battle Resort area, where you can get new Pokemon and Battle e -Tran. It's like they took the best parts of both Emerald and Fire Red's post games and merged them into one spectacular feast, and my god, it's delicious. But finally, it's time to get into everyone's favorite sections the music and the brand new Pokemon. In terms of the former, once again, Go Ichinos and the entire composing team crushed it, giving the world of Sinnoh its most varied and interesting score yet. This is a blue collar region, and the music really brings that element out between its rustic and at times almost western feel. Now, I'll go on record and say that it's probably my least favorite soundtrack among all core Pokemon games, but once again, it's worth noting that Pokemon music is the pizza of the gaming industry, as even when it's not my favorite personal brand, it's still appetizing as hell. In fact, some of my all-time favorite tracks come from this region, including Jubilife City, the nighttime Pokemon theme, and of course, Cynthia's Battle theme, which is probably my all-time favorite battle music across every game in the entire series. Yeah, it's that good. And with music out of the way, that just leaves the Pokemon themselves, and despite getting a bad rap from a lot of folks, I actually really enjoy this roster. It's not as consistent as Gen 3's, but when these designs work, they really work, and for those claiming that hitting up past gens for new evolutions is a bad thing, please refrain from watching basically every review from here on out, since that's just a thing that we have to accept from this franchise going forward. It's how they connect the old and the younger generation of players, and besides, when you get amazing pocket monsters like Electivire and Glysaur, do you really have anything to whine about? Some of my personal favorite Gen 4 additions include Torterra, Luxray, Staraptor, Nespaquin, The Fossils, Gastrodon, Miss Magius, Garchomp, Spiritomb, Lucario, Hippodown, Mantike, 
Weavile, Togekiss, Electivire, The New Evolutions, Glysaur, Gallade, Frostlass, Dust Noir, The Lake Guardians, and virtually every legendary and mythical Pokémon, minus maybe Heatran and Fuel. Also, it's worth mentioning that this was the gen where they finally tried to outdo Mew by giving us the creator of everything within the Pokémon universe. So yeah, those who think Gen 4's roster sucks are out of their minds, because despite not having a ton of original designs, the ones we did get were for the most part brilliant. And speaking on biased, Gen 4 may be the best roster we've ever gotten at one single time, at least thus far in this review series. Okay, so we all good? You feeling all warm and fuzzy knowing that I loved a lot about your favorite generation? That's good, because I'm about to want you all of that goodwill in just a moment. Hope you got your Phoenix ready. The Con. This generation is slow. Yeah, I know that's a recurring joke thrown around by Gen 4 haters, but you know what? They're not wrong. It took me almost three hours to finally get my first gym badge, and yeah, you can fiddle with items like tech speed and battle animations to accelerate the process, but even so, I honestly believe the game suffers from severe pacing issues. We're talking long gaps between gyms, cryptic hints that send you on wild goose chases, particularly between the 7th and 8th gyms, and often very slow and tedious battles. It takes a long time to level up, to use recovery moves, and don't even get me started on status moves and weather battles. The guiltiest defender of all, though, is the actual plot itself. Yes, you have a few run-ins with Team Galactic and Cyrus early on, but if I'm being honest, I was bored out of my mind going from town to town up until around Veilstone, where admittedly the story got really great and kept me hooked for the rest of the game. But it took me around 10 hours to even get to that point, and yeah, I know there's plenty of you out there who can probably get there in half of that time, but I'm not making this review for you. I tried to make these videos in hopes of inspiring younger people to go back and check out these brilliant games, as I was hoping to bring back some older fans who haven't played them in years, and for those folks, they're likely going to be in for a bit of a dull time at first. And along with the pacing, I also have to be unfairly critical of this game's difficulty, because those of you used to more recent installments are in for a very rude awakening. I'd be lying if I said I personally didn't enjoy how frustratingly tough these games can be at times, because Frankly, for us more competitive people out there, these games are a breath of fresh air compared to the hand-holding of later games. Virtually every major character or gym leader will have Pokémon much higher leveled than your own throughout the entire game, and unless you venture through Sinnoh on multiple occasions, odds are you're going to black out more times than the previous three gens combined. And honestly, I have no idea how a 7 year old in 2009 beat this game, because I had some troubles in this one, and I sort of play Pokémon for a living now, so what does that say? I know this is a controversial opinion, and people will tell me that I'm the one to blame here, but to me there's a difference between difficult and unforgiving, and this game crosses that line a little too much for a general audience, even if once again I personally really appreciate the challenge as a veteran of the series. Also, while I'm sort of still on the topic of pacing, you know what really kills your fun while you're trying to catch them all and progress through the story? The need to use HMs in like half of the major areas in the game. Surf, Fly, and Strength I can sort of get behind since they're decent moves, but seriously Game Freak, you remove Dive only to create Defog and Rock Climb? And yeah, Defog is sort of optional, but if you don't use it when things get misty, Trainer Battles become a nightmare, and of course Rock Climb may be one of the worst necessary HMs in any Pokemon game ever. I basically had to neuter my team at multiple points throughout the game in order to accomplish some goal or access some hidden area, and quite a few of these times you're nowhere near a Pokemon Center, so HM slaves are practically useless after the first few towns. And that's sort of my big issue here. The game is hard enough that you need to raise and train 6 strong Pokemon to even stand a chance, but then you need HMs like all of the time to keep going. It's just a massive pain that players have to make the decision between quality and adaptability, and honestly, I'd recommend in future playthroughs just adding a Bibberol on your team even if it's not remarkable, because it flat out sucks when you find yourself stuck somewhere with no way to climb a wall or smash a rock just to proceed in your adventure. Beyond pacing, difficulty, and HM issues though, my only real complaint is a lack of creativity in the world and the region. And yeah, that sounds like a bit of a contradiction when you consider my pro section, but let me explain. Yes, the touchscreen features, Wi-Fi implementation, and refined battle mechanics were big steps forward, and I won't try to undermine them at all. And yeah, I think the plotline is superb, and the roster of Pokémon is fantastic. But for the most part, I sort of feel like this game is just the best of what's come before. 
A more polished and refined entry that leaves the others in the dust in terms of enjoyment, but also doesn't take many risks. Gen 1 was the creator. Gen 2 gave us shinies, breeding, a day and night cycle. Gen 3 gave us double battles, abilities and natures, contests, weather, and the battle frontier. But Gen 4 is a little bit stagnant. We have the day and night cycle making a return, we have a better battle frontier, better contests, as well as better graphics, sprites, and a ruthless crime organization, but nothing throughout your journey really stands out as particularly fresh. Which again isn't all a bad thing. Masuda wanted this game to be the ultimate Pokemon version, and in almost every conceivable way it is. But with very little risks, it can also sometimes feel just a little overly familiar, which I think is another reason why I found it a bit dull in the beginning, especially coming off of Emerald and Fire Red. But finally, it's time to get into the worst of the Gen 4 Pokemon, and, well, surprisingly, there's not as many as you think. I mean, yeah, you got Burmy, Sherim, Carnivine, and the Finian line, but even when Gen 4 fails, it fails in such a memorable way that you can't really fault it. Also, yeah, I think that the roster of legendary Pokemon is a little bloated, but with most of them being either integral to the story, or having either a great design or mythology around them, I can forgive the ridiculous amount for the most part. What I'm a little less forgiving about is the fact that in Platinum at least, there are five roaming legendary Pokemon to capture. Yes, that's right, five. That's almost double Crystal and Emerald combined, and offers the worst sort of padding to the post-game I can think of. But I will say you can at least track them with the Poketch app, so there is a little, small, teeny silver lining there. So yeah, I guess after going in on these games for their small but noticeable flaws, I've probably alienated a few hardcore fans, but regardless of a few dumb roamers, I once again think that this is a varied and enjoyable roster of Pokemon, and with that, let's get into the verdict as well as wrap this thing up. Final verdict. Honestly, it's a shame that when these games first came out, I was at an age where Pokemon was considered to be uncool on the playground, because I truly feel like these were the games I needed when I was entering high school. Yeah, they're ridiculously hard and tedious at times, but with compelling characters, a breathtaking story, and a message about believing in yourself and the strength in others, they're incredible pieces of art that Game Freak should be immensely proud of. Is Gen 4 the ultimate version? Well, I don't think so because a lot of that will depend on your personal preferences and experiences. But I do consider it one of the best developed and most robust entries among the entire series. And if you've only ever played Diamond and Pearl, I urge you to get Platinum as soon as possible because trust me, you're missing out on the best way to experience Sinnoh. And with that, I'm going to give Pokemon Platinum a solid A. It's got debatably the best roster of Pokemon yet, a world that feels alive, as well as the best story, characters, and battling system of any game to date. And if it only had have been a smidge faster and taken a few more risks, I would have felt comfortable calling it one of the best games I've ever played, period. So if you're eagerly awaiting a remake of Diamond and Pearl, stop staring at your phone waiting for an announcement and pop this phenomenal entry into your 3DS, because in my opinion, Pokemon Platinum is the best these games will ever get. Well, there it was in all of its cinnery glory. I hope you guys don't mind that this one took a little bit longer to make. Uh, there is a lot in these games, and I do apologize for those of you who have been anxiously awaiting this review. Uh, next up, we're going to be taking a look at everyone's favorite Gen 2 remakes in Pokemon Heart Gold and Soul Silver. Will this version be able to outdo all of the good I found in Gen 2 already? Well, you'll have to tune in this spring to find out, because it's probably going to take me a while to record all of the footage. But regardless, I hope you guys really did enjoy this this review. And uh, as I always say, happy hunting, baby rhinos. And I promise more content is on the way, so stay tuned.
I was just sitting here reading my book, really close to my face, and thinking about past Christmas memories. Of them all, I still think the best one by far was Christmas 2000, where I was lucky enough to get not- You know what's funny? During my original Gen 2 review, I had the audacity to claim that Crystal's only real flaw was that it wasn't as good as its Gen 4 remake. And although I do still stand behind that stance somewhat, I think it's pretty obvious that my lack of experience as a reviewer, as well as my own personal nostalgia, maybe got in the way of common sense. I mean, you can't even get some of the best Johto Pokémon until you're halfway through Kanto, and unfortunately these remakes don't entirely fix that issue. But you know what they do improve? Well, pretty much everything else from the original trilogy, and then go beyond further. So please sit back, get comfy, and grab your Pokémon as we dive into the sprawling worlds of Pokémon Heart Gold and Soul Silver. As expected after the mass success of Pokémon Fire Red and Leaf Green, Game Freak were all too eager to keep giving fans remakes, and thus, towards the end of Gen 4, Pokémon Heart Gold and Soul Silver were released on the Nintendo DS in 2010, featuring Wi-Fi and an updated presentation, more in-game content, and of course Platinum's unrivaled battle system. These remakes proved even more successful than their predecessors, and would go on to sell upwards of 12 million copies combined. Like Diamond and Pearl before them, I initially passed on these games since I was still in my jaded Pokemon is for kids phase, and I actually wouldn't experience them in their entirety until after X and Y. That's right, despite my weird obsession with all things Generation 2, I put off playing these babies until after Mega Pinsir was a thing. Why would I do this, you may ask? Well, I think the truth is I was probably scared. Whether it was because I assumed they'd tarnish my precious first memories with the series, or frightened that maybe the games that got me through a rough childhood patch were actually bad, the fact was I was terrified to find them. But sometime after Gen 6, I mustered up the courage, popped my brother's old copy of Soul Silver into my 3DS, and got on with it. And as you'll see soon enough, I'm really glad that I did. The game starts off pretty much how I remember, as you can tell protagonists Ethan and Lyra on their journey across the Johto region, collecting badges, taking down bad guys, and of course catching them all once again, while players behind the scenes have their very own adventures with the brand new Pokewalker. What's a Pokewalker, I hear you ask? Well, the minds of Game Freak came up with the ingenious idea to enable any pocket monster at the time to strut their stuff behind the Avatar player, a la Pikachu in yellow version. And as a brilliant marketing tie-in, we got this pedometer-centric peripheral which allowed players to take part in mini-games, collect valuable items, and of course connect even more to their virtual companions one step at a time. But yeah, besides a few notable differences, everything you loved about Johto is all here, with Gen 4's gorgeous sprite work and updated music, while also expanding on the mythology around the ancient region. Along with meteor roles for various gym leaders, side characters, and of course your rival Silver, these games also provide the Kimono Girls from Gold, Silver, and Crystal with more to do as the link between you and the game's masters. As for Suicune, it, along with Yusin, also have a larger presence within the story, as our player must now follow them throughout both major regions. And yes, as many of you know, Kanto makes a major comeback in these games, and it is glorious. In my Crystal review, I noted that although it's awesome to revisit Gen 1's many famous locales, overall most of the region is pretty vacant, with not a ton to do. But I guess Game Freak must have realized this and done everything in their power to make up for this transgression, because with a few noticeable exceptions here and there, and Team Rocket notwithstanding, Kanto is now almost as memorable as the game's main region, except it has better pacing. I'm not joking either. I already mentioned the Suicune stuff, but on top of that, you've got new and exciting locales, much stronger gym leaders, and more obtainable legendary Pokémon than I can count. We're talking all three legendary birds, Latios and Latios, the Gen 3 mascot legendaries, and to top it all off, Mewtwo is back in Cerulean Cave waiting to be challenged because why not? Mind you, some of these guys are version exclusives, but still, on top of Johto's roster of mascots and roamers, this is some great bonus content that adds some challenge to the once very region. Although I always found Zapdos' nest of Unlike the other two birds, it just sits there so awkwardly out of place. On top of all that, Johto's added a few new spices into the mix as well, with the brand new and honestly superior Safari Zone, improved and updated gyms, as well as a Battle Frontier rip straight out of Platinum. And speaking of Platinum, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of its battle system and mechanics are carried over seamlessly into these remakes, with its updated moves, items, and heck, even some of its mythology fitting perfectly into the established worlds of Generation 2. They also fixed one of my biggest gripes in the original trilogy, by giving the top team Rocket admins their own code names, which I imagine was heavily influenced by Team Galactic's role in their respective games. Mind you, I don't know if it completely undoes the lack of identity the team still exudes without Giovanni as their leader, but it was certainly an attempt to do better, and you have to appreciate that. 
And while on the topic of Viridian's former gym leader, his son Silver manages to remain the same power-seeking brat we've grown to love, while also becoming more endearing to the player as they discover what exactly makes this thieving rival tick. The two standouts are of course how in these games he eventually cares enough for his Pokémon that his Golbat evolves into a Crobat, as well as the heartbreaking cutscene he shares with his father. And it's here that I'm finally going to dish out some criticism to these otherwise applauded games. In my opinion, the time-traveling cutscene that shows the fate of Giovanni should have never been relegated to a vent only. There is so much character, so much emotion, and so much power in the scene between Silver and his father that it's almost unforgivable that 99% of players will never truly understand why Silver idolizes power the way he does, and it makes his transformation into a loving trainer all the more impactful in hindsight. I understand that this event was created as a promotion for the new Celebi film at the time, and that it's only even possible because of the mythical Forest Guardian, but of all of the blocked content, this is the only one I will ever complain about, because it's one of the most poignant exchanges in the entire franchise, and it's a shame it was relegated to a marketing style. Other than that gripe though, these games shoot for the stars and in almost every single way surpass them. The challenge and strategy required is much higher, the pacing is improved immensely, and somehow those masterminds at Game Freak found a way to add an overwhelming amount of new content, while still leaving almost every piece of nostalgia effortlessly intact. These remakes look better, they sound better, and they know exactly when to experiment and throw in the perfect amount of fan service. And for doing all of that and going even beyond, Pokemon Heart Gold and Soul Silver aren't just the best Pokemon remakes so far, but quite possibly the best remakes ever made. And so I guess in the end, the only thing I should have been afraid of was how many hours of fun I'd have with these wonderfully charming games. So there you go, my thoughts on what I consider to be my personal favorite game in the entire series. Now all that's left to ask is, Game Freak, when the heck are we getting walking Pokemon again? Seriously. Anyways, I know this one may have seemed a little short, and I'm sure I skipped over a few smaller tweaks and changes here and there, but overall these games are great, and their originals are great too, so I think it's worth experiencing both for yourself in order to see what the hype is all about. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we've officially entered Poké Month 2017. Of course, there's going to be lots of debate, discussion, and opinions as we take a look at some of the series' most notorious elements. And it's all going to culminate in my in-depth review of Pokémon Black and White, which are games I haven't played in more than six years. And trust me, these ones are going to be a lot longer than 10 minutes. Will it be as good as I remember? Well, only time will tell, but needless to say, I'm excited for everything this summer has to offer, and as I always say, happy hunting, baby rhinos. Oh, and in two weeks from now, you're getting a very special N64-related video. That's all I'm going to say for now. See you then. What up guys, my name is Stan from Random Pens, and today's video is sort of a biggie. In fact, from the moment I released my Gen 2 review last December, I immediately had people asking me to take a look at the next installments in the Pokemon franchise. I'm not sure if this is because the video went over well, or if Gen 3 is more popular than I thought, but regardless, here we are, finally taking a look at this much requested video. Now of course the plan was always to review Pokemon Emerald for the end of Pokemon 2016. However, depending on how this video does, I might be more inclined to review Gen 4 faster than I initially would have. But that's another topic for another day. For now though, we're looking at Gen 3. Is it worthy of being considered the best generation of all time, or is it just another rinse and repeat game in the series? Well, let's find out. The Game after the continued success of Gold and Silver, Pokémon was a global juggernaut, having sold tens of millions of games worldwide, and undoubtedly many Nintendo handhelds in the process. 
As you'd imagine, this sort of money and acclaim led to the decision to continue the franchise past its initial conclusion with the Gen 2 games, and so Game Freak got right to work on a follow-up to their most lucrative IP. This time, however, original Pokemon creator and director Satoshi Tajiri took on a much more minimal role within the team, and left his baby in the hands of famed composer-turned-director Junichi Masuda. With Masuda at the helm, it was decided that rather than continuing the story of Red and Ethan, this new installment would be intended as a reboot tool, utilizing the brand new Game Boy Advance as its hardware. This new system and direction gave the team a lot more freedom to create new worlds and features, and the soft reboot idea would eventually become a recurring mechanic in all subsequent main series games. And on March 19th, 2003, after years of grueling work, North America finally got their hands on the next installment in the blockbuster franchise, Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire. Despite being released to stateside at a time when Pokemon was experiencing its first real downswing, fans still came out in droves to purchase the brand new adventure, and these two games combined would eventually become the Game Boy Advance's best-selling titles. With Pokemania back in the spotlight, albeit to a much lesser degree, Game Freak decided to stay true to the classic formula, and give fans a definitive version of the game in the form of Pokemon Emerald, released two years later. Now although I bought Ruby along with a copy of Sapphire for my younger brother right after their initial launch, I never owned Emerald myself. However, I did play the main campaign on a friend's copy during a weekend getaway to his parents' farm. Yeah, I wasn't exactly the most active kid at 12 years old. Regardless though, Emerald always sort of stuck out to me as the director's cut version of the original Gen 3 games, and as such, I'll be using it as the main subject for most of my review. However, unlike Crystal, there are some real differences worth pointing out here, so I'll be sure to talk about the important changes between Emerald and its predecessors where necessary. And with that out of the way, let's take a look at Pokemon Emerald. The story. As I mentioned in the previous section, Gen 3 is a soft reboot of the series, however, most of the core plot mechanics from the Tajiri era are carried over into this game flawlessly. This time around, you take control of Brendan or May, a 10-year-old Pokemon enthusiast who's recently moved to a vast new region called Hoenn due to their father becoming one of its esteemed gym leaders. Immediately upon moving in, your dad runs off to his dream job and leaves you to make friends in your new hometown of Little League. It's here that you'll meet your pseudo-rival, Brendan or May, depending on which gendered avatar you pick, and eventually their father, the esteemed Professor Birch. Unlike Oak and Elm before him, Professor Birch enjoys working in the field, as his research focuses on Pokemon habitat, but upon meeting him for the first time, it's clear he's bitten off more than he can chew, as a wild Poochiena is attacking him. Now it's up to you to choose one of the game's three new starter Pokemon, save the Professor, and begin your Hoenn Pokemon adventure. I won't lie, I always really connected to this opening as a kid, as I could relate to the new town scenario, and I always thought the split second decision of choosing a Pokemon here made much more sense than just getting one because you're 10. You choose Trico, Torchic, or if you're like me in this particular place, Mudkip to save someone, but like a real life animal would, it gets attached to you after your battle, and so the decision to go out collecting Pokemon feels more natural. Regardless, you eventually battle your rival, get a Pokedex, and then eventually make your way to Petalburg Gym, where your father commends you on your progress, but clarifies that you're still not at his level yet. It's here that you also meet your other pseudo-rival, Wally, for the first time. Wally is a sickly boy with a big passion for Pokemon, and with your help, he eventually catches his own pocket monster and begins to feel confident once again. It's after you help out Wally and get rejected by your dad that our protagonist can battle the first gym leader, Roxanne, of Rustboro City. It's also in this area that you'll encounter the first instance of Team Aqua, a pirate-like organization who are up to no good. Now it's here that I have to address the first major change Emerald makes to its story, which is rather than have Team Aqua or Team Magma be the nefarious group of Gen 3, players must take on both. I'll be giving my thoughts on this update later, but just know that minus a few extra Team Magma battles, the plot is virtually the same regardless of whichever version you choose, at least until very late in the story. Once Team Aqua's grunts are disposed of, you'll be thanked by Mr. Stone, the president of the Devon Corporation, and asked to deliver a letter to his son, Steven. You'll also receive a new device known as the Pokemon, which sort of works as an all-purpose smartphone. And with a mission in hand, our hero ventures across the sea to Dufer Town, where he delivers the letter to Steven Stone, a rock collector, after taking on the second gym leader, Brawler. Once the letter's been delivered, it's time to hit the open sea once again. However, this time our player travels to Slateport City, where they'll be confronted with Team Aqua's leader, Archie. He'll issue a stern warning not to get in his way again, and after delivering the Devon goods acquired during the first Aqua encounter to Captain Stern, it's time to head north to Mothra. It's here you'll battle both your rival and Wally once again, on the way to and in Mothville City, respectively. Honestly, there's not much to say about Mayor Brendan here, however, in Wally's case, he's feeling much stronger since moving to the cleaner Verdanturf town, and makes it clear he wants to be a strong trainer too. 
It's also right here in Mauville that you can claim the third gym badge from the Electric Watson. Get it? And afterwards, you'll travel through many new routes and towns until you reach Team Magma in the hollowed out Meteor Falls. In all three versions, you'll actually run into both teams. And in Emerald, it's also where you learn that Team Magma wishes to expand the world's landmass in order to... build model homes? I've actually always been pretty confused when it comes to their motivation, as even though theirs is just as dumb, you could argue Team Aqua's plan to expand the sea could be out of extreme activism, but then they've done it. Yeah, they're not the smartest crime organizations though, but even still, it's up to you and your Pokémon to thwart them whenever they might turn up again. Which is really soon, as you chase whichever team was driven out of Meteorite Falls up to Mount Chimney, where you'll battle its leader and prevent the apocalypse. Halfway through the game, and we've already saved the world once. You know, compared to the Radio Tower thing in Gen 2, these groups feel a lot more threatening. Anyway, when you finally dispose of the Red Flag, you'll be able to continue your adventure by beating Laveridge Town's Fire-type leader Flannery, and then making your way back to Petalburg to show your dad how much you've improved. Once defeated, Norman will award you with his gym's back, as well as some encouraging work. And after picking up Surf next door from Wally's grateful father, it's time to head north towards Fortree City. On the way there, you'll have to battle Team Aqua or Magma again at the Weather Institute, depending on the version. But in terms of the city itself, this is one of my favorite areas in the entire game, as it's a wild forest utopia comprised of livable treehouses that make it radiate with identity. It's also in this town that you can battle Winona, the flying-type gym leader, after you've received the Devon's Hope from our good friend Steven Stump. With the sixth badge added to your growing collection, you'll then be ready to visit Mount Pyre, where you'll once again run into Team Aqua's leader Archie, who's stolen the Red Orb, in order to awaken the legendary Pokémon, Kyogre. In the original two games, the player is given the remaining orb in order to counteract the evil plot. However, in Emerald, it's revealed that Maxi has already stolen the Blue Orb, and so you must take down both teams before it's too late. This is where my least favorite part of the campaign comes into play, as you'll be battling grunt after grunt and going back and forth across Hoenn in order to put an end to Team Magma and Team Aqua once and for all. This is of course made even worse in Emerald, as you have to effectively stop not one, but two evil crime organizations with what are effectively the exact same goals, and the games really don't do anything to make this slog feel more bearable. I'll touch on this a little bit more in depth in my con section later on, but in my brief opinion, it's the worst kind of patty, and it just makes the game slow down at this point. Eventually though, both parties lose control of their respective mascot legendary, and after obtaining the seventh badge from twins Kate and Liza in Moss Beach City, you'll travel to the Cave of Origins in Sotopolis City to set things right. In Ruby and Sapphire, it's here that you can catch either Groudon or Kyogre, which puts an end to the temporal chaos going on around the world. However, in Emerald, you must visit the Sky Pillar and awaken the legendary Pokémon Rayquaza, who basically just nags the other two into submission and then flies away. It's a little anticlimactic, but with things set right and Team Aqua and Team Magma coming to a truce, it's now time to claim your final gym badge from Juan in Sotopolis and take on the Pokémon League Challenge once again. Before you can make your mark, however, your old friend Wally shows up at Victory Road to see if you're strong enough to test your might, and in doing so, proves that he's grown up quite a bit since your last encounter. But after dispatching the green-haired Asthmatic, it's finally time to battle the Elite Four. First up this time around is Sid, a Dark-type user. Like many of the Elite Four, Sid loves to use status-effective moves, and will mess your team up through strategy rather than sheer force, so it's always a good idea to stock up on berries and healing items before taking on this incarnation of the Pokémon League. After him, it's on to Team, a Ghost-type user who seems sweet at first, but can send your Pokémon to the afterlife with one bad move. Once again, patience is key, and soon you'll find yourself face-to-face -face with Glacia, the appropriately named Ice-type specialist of the Elite Four. My particular team had a few troubles with the Ice Team, but overall I feel like she's actually the most forgiving member, and mainly serves as an appetizer to the Dragon Master of the Elite Four, Rizzy here certainly isn't as tough as Lance, but his Pokémon do have far more type variety, and so if you want to beat this walking pirate stereotype, you're going to need a well-balanced team. Once he goes down, however, you'll be ready to take on the Hoenn Region Champion, Mr. Steven Stone. Uh, unless you're playing Emerald, in which case you'll be facing off against the former Cetopolis gym leader Wallace to see who's the true Pokémon master. Wallace is no pushover, but I've always felt like he was a poor replacement for Steven, especially from a narrative standpoint. Either way, when you finally emerge victorious and become the new champion of the Hoenn region, you'll meet up with old friends and have your name registered in the Pokémon Hall of Fame. A fitting end to a tumultuous journey. Of course, unlike Gold and Silver, this is the final act of the game, and beyond some exceptional post-game events and attractions, we've reached a definitive end at least story -wise. The pros. 
Something I've always appreciated is that along with the obvious one in regards to friendship and trust, each generation of Pokemon has its own distinctive theme and corresponding lessons that it tries to bring into the fold. For example, Generation 1 explores heavy themes involving science and the ambiguous ethics of experimenting on and corrupting nature. However, in this generation of games, the developers took a different approach and decided to bring nature to the forefront and explore themes of tampering with and manipulating our natural surroundings. In many ways, it's sort of a reversal of Gen 1. However, it doesn't leave much ambiguity at all. From Professor Birch to settings and locales to the new Pokemon, you get a sense that Game Freak wanted to reel in the science and myth and give players the most organic feeling Pokemon adventure yet, and I believe they succeeded in this regard. The theme of nature also directly ties into one of the many new features this game brought with it, which is the environment itself. Like the real world, the weather all around Hoenn changes based on various meteorological factors, including a Pokemon's move or ability. Not only does this create more immersive and visually appealing battles, but it also goes a long way in making this world feel more alive, and makes strategy that much more amazing. Along with this feature, Ruby and Sapphire were also the first core games to implement abilities and Pokemon natures into every past and present Pokemon, giving the games a much needed boost of strategy and challenge. Now, obviously, Pokemon will never be the most complex of our games, but these two small additions really opened up the metagame to a variety of new options and effectively created viability in competitive battles. Speed boost Blaziken, anyone? These games also expanded the ideas of IVs, that is, individual values, and boosted each Pokemon's from 15 to 31 in each main category. This allowed even more variety, and along with nature's really helped turn breeding into its very own genre of Pokemon. Another obvious addition to the series that always makes me smile is the new Double Battle mode. It seems so simple and like such a mainstay now, but even to this day, I would still much rather lock eyes with two trainers rather than one. Personally, I think this opens up the game to more strategy as well as allows other Pokemon to grow faster if they're at a slight level disadvantage. Plus, seeing new and unique ways of Pokemon working together never gets old, and by far I think Double Battles may be my favorite new addition to come out of Gen 3. While mixing up the battle formula, the developers also tried their hands at creating new and inventive ways in which to use Pokemon. First up, we have Contest, a type of optional minigame that allows trainers a way to show off the appeal of their prized pocket monsters rather than their power. As you can probably tell from the lack of footage, collecting ribbons from these contests was never really my thing, but I sort of think that's the point. This gave players who prefer the cosmetic appeal of Pokemon more ways to bond with their virtual creatures, and although the mechanics could use some work, the idea itself is at least fresh, which still makes it a winner in my books. Another new minigame style addition is the inclusion of the secret base. All around Hoenn, you'll find small holes and walls, or enormous tree bushes that you can use a new TM, secret power, to hollow out and build yourself a personalized fort. Now, although Contest had the option of using a link cable to play with others, it never really caught on in the same way that secret bases did with my small group of friends. As a 10 year old, I spent an embarrassing amount of hours trying to find the best furniture and most spacious cave to house my special tree fort, all so I could then compare and contrast with the other kids at my babysitters. There's mostly no point to it of course, but it was a fun little addition nonetheless that I think also mildly expands the role of nature in these games. However, finally, in what may be the most famous post-game feature, we have the illustrious Battle Frontier. Now, sadly, this battle-heavy island is an Emerald exclusive, but in my opinion, this is the reason why that game stands apart. Home to seven different types of battling buildings, the Frontier is what you get when you take the Battle Tower from Ruby and Sapphire and inject it full of polka steroids. It's owned and operated by a shady man named Scott, who's been bumping into our protagonist since the first main town. And with his blessing, you can take the Frontier Challenge and truly prove your abilities. Depending on which facility you tackle first, you'll discover a varying degree of challenge, as each dome or arena boasts its own type of unique battling structure. But no matter which you choose, after enough victories, you'll be challenged by the respective building's Frontier Brook, who can be a real pain in the ass to reach. In fact, I spent multiple hours just trying to capture footage of one of these Frontier Brains, and even then it was only at the silver level and I just happened to win because my Wailord knew a ghost type move. So yeah, the Battle Frontier is no walk in the park, but trust me when I say that when playing the game for fun, rather than a long-winded review, this one post-game feature adds dozens of additional hours of content, and I truly believe this is Emerald's greatest strength. And speaking of post-game, this may sound blasphemous, but next to Gen 2 Secret Kanto Surprise, I wholeheartedly believe that these games have the strongest after-credits adventure of any core Pokemon experience. Once the Elite Four is beaten for the first time, you'll find yourself going off and hunting down tons of legendary Pokemon, as well as probably checking out most of the optional features like contests once the main campaign is finished. 
Depending on which version you have, the legendaries will be slightly different in terms of what you can add to your collection, with Kyogre and Latias being Sapphire exclusives and Groudon and Latios being Rubies. And in the case of Emerald, you basically get a shot at catching all three Hoenn mascots, although you actually get a choice as to which Eon Pokemon you want, however, without a cheating device, it's almost impossible to obtain the other, especially nowadays. Despite being roaming Pokemon, Latios and Latias aren't nearly as annoying as the legendary beasts from Gen 2. And in fact, I actually ran into the one I chose, Latias, while surfing near Pacifilodge Town while completing another post-game quest, The Secret of the Regis. Yes folks, on top of featuring two brand new legendary roaming Pokemon, as well as three mascot legendaries, we're also treated to another trio, the legendary Golem. Unlike the legendary birds or the legendary beasts, Regirock, Registeel, and Regice can only be unlocked after the player completes what may be the most cryptic puzzle in all of Pokemon history. In fact, I would go as far as to say that this is some Castlevania 2 red crystal type levels of bulk. And you know what? I like it. Unlike that game, Gen 3 was one of those juggernaut titles that almost every other kid on the playground had, so word of mouth was much more common on the schoolyard, and even without having reliable internet at the time, I was still able to complete the puzzles with the help of a few knowledgeable friends. And it's the initial intrigue and the way it leads to this sort of communication that I think makes this series so great in the first place. And despite not caring too much about the Reggies themselves, the mystery surrounding them was always one of my favorite parts of exploring Hoenn's post-game world. Now, before I move on to the cons, there are a few Few more positives I want to address. In terms of music, once again each new town and each new theme breathes just a little more life into these games, and I feel like this is the gen where composer Go Ichinoise really came into his own. Yes, there are a lot of trumpets, and no, I don't think the music is more iconic than Gen 1's, but there are a ton of standout tracks like the surf theme that I would rank among the series best. I'm not going to get too in depth into the music as I feel like the whole it's great but not as iconic as Gen 1 thing will be a recurring theme among the remainder of these in-depth reviews, but some of my personal favorite tracks include Old Dale Town, Slateport City, Route 110, Verdant Turf Town, Route 113, the Battle Frontier main theme, and many many more. And finally, one of the best parts of this game is the inclusion of Wally. He's not exactly a rival in this game, in fact he's almost like your apprentice in a lot of ways, but he's a solid character who feels shut out, and a lot of this game's about him taking back control of his life and doing the things he wants to do, and I think that makes him pretty relatable. Of course, I could also go into detail about how he's only able to do all of this after gaining a friend in our hero, as well as moving to a town untampered by pollution therefore reaffirming the whole friendship is king and leave nature alone themes the game's trying to present, but honestly he doesn't need all of that analysis. He's just a likable character who grows along with you, and although he's certainly no silver, is so much better than the other pseudo rival in this game. Speaking of which... The Con. As some of you likely noticed when talking about the story, the rival character, that is Brendan or May, started to have less of an impact and just sort of faded off altogether. This wasn't a deliberate choice, but in actuality that's just sort of what the game does with this character. Sure, I skipped a few of the later battles in my rundown, but that's because your rival in this game starts off great and then just sort of becomes an afterthought. In fact, it's actually Wally who you battle with before the Elite Four, not Brendan or May, which sort of summarizes everything wrong about about this character's inclusion. I love the idea of this person being the professor's kid and all, but what's their true purpose? What's their end goal? I mean, I know they want to follow in their dad's footsteps, but considering they never even fully evolved their starter Pokemon, that sort of seems like a bad career choice. It's not that I dislike them entirely, but at the end of the day, they have the smallest impact of the series so far throughout these reviews, and when they show up to congratulate you for beating the Elite Four, you sort of wish Wally came instead. And speaking of the Elite Four, who thought making Wallace the champion in an Emerald version was a good idea? It's not even that he's a bad trainer, it's just compared to Steven, he's practically a stranger. It's clear that this was added in to give players of Ruby and Sapphire a little shock when they made it to the end of Emerald to prove that this game's different. But in my opinion, this is one instance where that doesn't work. Heck, even the games would canonically make Steven the Hoenn League champion once again in both future games and the eventual remake, so it's clear that even Game Freak knew this was a major misstep. And one can't talk about missteps without bringing up Emerald's handling of Team Aqua and Team Magma. Let me get this straight right now. In terms of gameplay and battling, Emerald is the far superior game. However, in terms of the overall narrative and pacing, Ruby and Sapphire are actually the best options. 
Not only do they have a champion who feels earned, but battling against one evil team is more than enough. The amount of backtracking, especially in Emerald, feels absolutely chore-like, and was clearly only introduced to pad out the game. Besides that though, I think Team Aqua and Team Magma as groups are a mixed bag when it comes to quality. They solved my no identity problem from the last review by having specific themes, motifs, colors, and even leaders that are all their own. All of this stuff combined does give them an identity, especially compared to the black and white Team Rocket, and it absolutely makes them memorable. My only gripe is that their plans make no sense. Team Magma wants to cover the world and land, but once again there's no motivation for why. It would sort of make sense if they worshipped Groudon, and the only way to revive him is by expanding the current landmass, but even that's not a great reason, and it's certainly not what they're after here. And as I mentioned in the story section, Aqua's just as bad as their red counterpart, because submerging the entire world in water means that they'll drown. So yeah, sorry guys, but their motives just don't cut it for me in these games. As for the whole too much water thing, it never really bugged me. In fact, when I think of Hoenn, I fondly remember it as the beautiful tropical region with lots of waterfalls and the cool underwater city. I will however say that the utilization of HMs in this game is ridiculous. Surf and a few others are obviously fine, but man oh man does it suck when you have to effectively plan your party around HMs. For example, I wasn't planning on having two water types and a Hariyama on my team, but because this game goes out of its way to force the player into using HMs like Dive and Rock Smash at every turn, I found myself having to build my team around both battle ability and usefulness on the map, and it's just a little too much here for my taste. I mean, you can argue that Gen 1 also used a lot of HMs to solve puzzles, especially later in the games, but with those installments it felt like necessary padding due to tech limitations. Here it just feels like intentional bloat. And besides the unnecessary padding, that's my only real gripe with this generation of games. At times, they really try to recapture that Gen 1 magic instead of just doing their own thing. Not all the time, mind you, but enough that it does keep reminding you of Kanto. Now I know that Gen 1 is iconic for a reason, and creating an improved game while keeping that feel should sound like a smart decision, but I think in hindsight it's a little frustrating because only a few years later we actually got Gen 1 remakes using the exact same engine. And for those wondering, I'm not just talking about actual events in the game, such as the first gym having a rock type leader, or three of the four Elite Four members sharing typing with their Gen 1 incarnation. I'm speaking more to the fundamentals of the game, the progression. It's not that these games have no originality, I think they keep things pretty fresh actually. Just, in general, I wish they took a few more risks 13 years ago, because maybe then we wouldn't be stuck in this perpetual loop of soft reboots, but that's a discussion for another day. And with those little nitpicks out of the way, I think it's time we start to wrap this up after one final category, the Pokémon themselves. The Pokémon. In past installments of these reviews, I've talked about the good and bad generational Pokémon in the pros and cons sections respectively, but with this video I figured I'd switch it up. Firstly, Ken Sugimori and his team did a great job of making nearly every Pokémon feel like an organic extension of the home region. From more animalistic designs like Corphish and Walrein, to Pokémon that incorporate weather and climate into their actual designs like Swablu or Tropius, this is THE generation for those who prefer natural looking Pokémon rather than the scientific or machine looking ones we see more of today. Some of my personal favorites include Sceptile, Ludicolo, Gardevoir, Slaking, Shedinja, Nosepass, Mawai, Medicham, Manetric, Sharpedo, Flygon, Altaria, Cradley, Duskull, Tropius, Absol, Flaylai, and most of the legendary. However, despite there being so many good ones, there's few that I would consider great, and there's also still a few odd or forgettable ones, including Mariana, Lombre, Surskit, Ulpin, Spoink, Spinda, Tacnia, Baltoy, and Lovegus. Once again, I want to state that I don't hate any of its designs, but to me and probably a few others, Gen 3 is that generation that has very few bad additions, but rarely introduces iconic ones. Again, it's all good, just not great. Also, I totally forgot Rumpig was even a Pokemon, let alone from way back in Gen 3. Whoops. So overall, there's a lot of good to this game, and there's some bad or uninspired aspects as well, but having compiled all of these highlights and lowlights, let's throw them into my thought blender and finally wrap this up. Final verdict. You know, it's fine. 
because as a kid, I went absolutely nuts over these three games. Between them all, I probably poured more than 500 hours into the Hoenn game, and I don't regret a single second of it, because I still love these games to death. I think they took one of the most iconic games of all time and rebooted them into something a little more accessible, a little more challenging, and a lot more immersive, and I would highly recommend either of these three to any fan of the series. In fact, I would still go as far as to say that these are still the superior versions when compared to their 2014 remakes for those who like a little more challenge in their Pokemon experience. And in terms of pure battle and strategy, I don't know if you'll ever find a game with more to do than ever. The game's got great characters, epic set pieces, fun mechanics, and the best post-game experience Gen 2 notwithstanding. So what are you waiting for? If you recently rediscovered the franchise thanks to the likes of Pokemon Go, or just a die-hard fan of the series who hasn't taken on the original Hoenn adventure in quite a while, I think it's the perfect time to pack your bags, strap on your running shoes, and break out your boots. Pokemon Generation 3 gets an A. Mine. It's a phenomenal entry in the never-ending adventure series, but some pacing issues at the very end, as well as some confusing motivations, just keep it from being fair. Well, that went longer than expected. They always do. But I hope you guys enjoyed reliving a little piece of my childhood with you today, and I hope you're just as excited for the next installment in this series. Of course, no Gen 3 review could be complete without talking about some very important remakes. And so, next time on this show, we're going to be taking a look at Fire Red and Elite Green for the Game Boy Advance. I know, I know, Pokemon is turning into a whole Poke Summer, but with the 20th anniversary, maybe that's not such a bad thing. Anyways, I'm hoping to get that out in the next few weeks, and I really hope that you guys join me for that mini review. But until then, follow us on Twitter, at Random10, if you have any questions, or you just want to talk. And as I always say, happy hunting, baby rhinos. I don't know what that was. finally here. Apologies to those who've been waiting, but things have been a little hectic behind the scenes, and with these particular videos, I want to give them the time they need rather than rushing them out for the sake of consistency, and I'd forgotten how long Gen 4 can take if you try and do everything. But yeah, after two months of work, I'm finally ready to give my opinion on these beloved games, and see if they're worthy of all that remake talk that's been going on for years now. Will they surpass Crystal and possibly even Emerald? Well, let's find out in this Gen 4 in-depth review. The game. After not only the global success of Ruby and Sapphire, but also the Gen 1 remakes, it was pretty much a guarantee that Game Freak would eventually get back on the proverbial saddle and give fans yet another adventure for the brand new Nintendo DS. And after a few years of waiting, Junichi Masuda and his team welcomed the world to the gorgeous Zinnoli in the forms of Pokemon Diamond and Despite these games releasing during what could be considered the franchise's weakest era, the series' rabid fanbase, as well as the DS, led to Diamond and Pearl eventually outselling Ruby and Sapphire as the fifth best-selling titles on the system. At the time of their release, I was a pretty awkward teenager, and beyond playing the campaign quickly on my brother's copy of Diamond, I pretty much skipped this generation entirely. However, about two years later, the team created yet another sister version of the game in the form of Pokemon Platinum, which I didn't pick up until only last year at a flea market on the cheap. Dubbed the ultimate Pokemon version by Masuda himself, this massive game made many changes to the Sinnoh League, including superior Wi-Fi, more wild Pokemon, and some incredible post-game content. But despite all of these improvements, does Platinum live up to Masuda's promise? Is this the ultimate Pokemon version? Well, dust off your old DS, and let's find out. The Story 
I want to preface the actual review by making it very clear that this is a review of Pokemon Platinum and only Pokemon Platinum. I know in my previous videos, I've done a few comparisons here and there between version exclusives. However, despite my love for Diamond and Pearl, it's my opinion that when it comes to Gen 4, Platinum isn't just a director's cut, it's the best version by a mile. This opinion may be controversial, but I feel like if you've owned this game, then you probably understand where I'm coming from. And with that little caveat out of the way, let's start at the very beginning. Like their predecessors, Diamond, Pearl, and Platinum are pseudo-reboots that serve as their own self-contained stories. This time we begin in Twin Leaf Town, where our protagonist, Lucas or Dawn, depending on which gender you choose, are messing around with their childhood friend, Barry, and stumble upon the renowned Professor Rowan and his assistant while attempting to run through some tall grass. After a lot of talking and some admittedly funny dialogue between Barry and the Professor, Rowan decides to entrust our heroes with their first ever Pokemon. In Gen 4, your choices are between Turtwig, Chimchar, and Pink, with my heart forever belonging to the adorable Team Turtle. After you've secured your starter and battled Barry for the first time, you'll eventually stumble across a weird blue-haired man at Lake Verity. He talks to himself about legendary Pokémon and then suspiciously walks off, leaving the player already asking questions, which is a pretty good start. Eventually, our hero and Barry obtain Pokédex to Rowan, and along with their new partner, set out to catch them all in order to assist the professor in his research of Pokémon evolution. Not long after beginning your quest, you'll stumble upon Lucky, a member of the International Police who's on the prowl for any suspicious grown-ups who may be hanging around. You see, there's a small cult-like group of people known as Team Galactic, who all wear ridiculous outfits and sport bull cuts, who've been up to no good across Cinema. You'll learn that despite being odd, the group is seemingly harmless, and after another battle with Barry, you'll head east to Orberg City, where you can obtain your first gym badge from the rock Pokemon enthusiast, Roar. One of the things I love about these games is how each town and each leader seem to have some sort of practical purpose, such as Orberg serving as a mining method, as I feel like it gives the entire region a lot more personality than Pokemon. Either way, once you beat Roar, our hero will make their way through a turn forest in order to face off against Gardenia of Eternal City to collect their second badge from the grass type gym. It's also in Eterna City that you'll cross paths with Jupiter, the second of Team Galactic's commanders, with the first being Mars who's beaten between badges and the of Windworks on the way to Eternal Regardless, once you take down Jupiter, it's time to proceed on quite a journey before you eventually end up in Heart Home City, where you can partake in Super Contests as well as grab your third gym badge from the Ghost-type Master, Fantine. Seriously though, it'll take you a while to take the Forest and Relic Badges, so be prepared for tons of battles along the way. Anyways, after passing through Silesian Town and heading north, you'll eventually find yourself in Veilstone City. It's here in this gambling town that you'll find Team Galactic headquarters. However, you'll be turned away at the entrance and instead you'll take on the fighting type gym leader, Maylene, in order to add the Cobble Badge to your own collection. After besting Maylene, you'll take on some goons from Team Galactic in order to help the professor's assistant retrieve their Pokemon. And after a quick chat with Booker, it become apparent that perhaps Team Galactic may not be as harmless as they initially seem. Despite his apprehensions, Looker sets you on a path towards Pastoria City, where you'll come across a shifty-looking member of Team Galactic, as well as the one and only Crasher Wake. This legendary Water-type user is the city's gym leader, as well as Barry Sensei in the art of everything Pokemon, and once defeated, he'll reward your efforts with the Fen Badge and some manly words in it. However, during your battle, that suspicious member of Team Galactic set off a bomb in the Safari Zone, and so it's up to you to chase the fiend back up to Lake Valor, where you'll also run into your old friend Cynthia. Cynthia is an older trainer who seems to always appear when the player needs her most, and this time she offers to advice as a grandmother in order to help figure out what Team Galactic are up to at the lakes. And it's upon reaching Cynthia's grandmother in selection time that the game's real narrative is revealed, as you learn about the various legendary Pokemon in Sinnoh, as well as battle Cyrus, Team Galactic's powerful leader. Yeah, remember that creepy guy from the beginning of the game? Turns out he's planning to capture the Lake Guardian, Mesprit, Azelf, and Uxi, in order to obtain something. But after he's defeated, Cyrus will retreat, and Cynthia's grandmother will point you towards Panelave Library, where you can study up on Sinnoh's various myths and legends, as well as nab your sixth badge from the town's steel-type gym leader, Byron, who also happens to be Rourke's distant father. And after meeting up with Barry, Professor Rowan, and Lucas or Don in Canalave's library, a giant explosion will send you to investigate Lake Valor, where you'll face Commander Saturn, who successfully captured Valor's psychic-type guardian, Azure. Now it's up to you and Barry to head way north in order to save Uxie at Lake Acuity, and beat Snowpoint City's gym leader, Candace, in order to obtain your second back. Unfortunately though, by the time you're able to reach the Lake's guardian, Team Galactic is already captured. 
sent them back to their base in Veilstone, where you'll need to rescue all three legendary Pokémon in order to save the world from Cyrus' evil plot. It's after you've traveled to Team Galactic HQ that you realize Cyrus and his cronies have been doing some horrific experiments on Pokémon in order to learn about their evolution properties so that Cyrus may create his own perfect world from the end of the harness. It's sort of a perversion of the exact research that Rowan does, and it really helps cement this cult of criminals as the most disturbing and vile organization yet. And so you must clear the warehouse, free the Lake Guardians, and follow Team Galactic to the historic Spear Pillar on Mount Coronet in order to prevent Cyrus from obliterating the current universe. Once there, however, Cyrus reveals his true colors and attempts to summon a being of pure energy, only to find himself at the mercy of something much more sinister. And it's here that players encounter the game's mascot, Giratina, in the Distortion world, which today may be one of the most interesting and confusing areas in all of Pokemon. However, after a grueling battle with both Cyrus and Giratina, the former will concede defeat, and with that, the day is saved from total annihilation once again thanks to an 11-year-old kid. And so, with Cyrus beaten and Team Galactic no more, the only thing left to do is for our hero to obtain the 8th and final badge to Sun Crow's gym leader Vulcaner and officially take on the Elite Four at Sinnoh's renowned Pokémon League. However, as for prediction, he'll have one final intense battle with Barry before taking on the challenge, and once beaten, he'll finally admit that perhaps he's still got a little training to do. And with all obstacles demolished and all battles won, it's time for the ultimate showdown between our hero and the Elite Four. First up is the Bug-type user, who's admittedly a bit of a pushover if you have at least one Fire or Flying-type member in your party. Next we have this region's token old person in Bertha and her Ground-type team. She can be a bit tricky, but she's certainly no Flint, who's the third trainer in this bomb. This Fire-type specialist offensive team will make you forget all about his silly red afro as you try to douse the fire in his heart. His words, not mine. And finally, last but not least, you'll take on William, a Psychic-type master who will leave your team in shambles if you've got no special defense. William, in my opinion, is the first true threat of the Elite Four, but with enough patience and 